I think we'll get started then. Karen, I see you're connected, which is good so far. I, I am. I have a backup plan. I should be I should be okay, but just in case if I go dark, I'll be calling in. Just have an okay. electrical issue here. Great. Yeah. It's funny because we we've, we've got one today too. I wondering if our systems are all getting overtaxed. Okay, good morning everyone. We'll do a roll call to confirm our quorum. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning everyone. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Zinica. Good morning. I'm here. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we will get started with today's meeting. As you know, we are um, doing this virtually again, um, as we've done since March 14th of 2020 using virtual technology. Many thanks to our IT department to allow us to seamlessly meet since then, given relief that the governor offered through an executive order um, to address the needs of public bodies like ours during the pandemic. Um, we are today already May 6, 2021, and it is our public meeting 343. With that, we'll get started um, with the minutes. Commissioner O'Brien. Yep, uh, Madam Chair, there are two sets of minutes in the packet today, um, January 14th, January 28th. Um, I think we have arrived. I think with the, uh, the group that's been working on these has spent a lot of time trying to get them, you know, concise but covering it up. I think they did a great job. Um, I would move in the first instance that we approve the minutes for January 14th, 2021, subject to any necessary corrections for typographical and material matters. Any questions or recommended edits? Oh, did I hear a second? I'm sorry. I second I'll that. second right now. Thank you. Edits, questions, comments? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Vivian, 4 zero. Thank you. Commissioner? Uh, and further, uh, Madam Chair, I do January 28th, 2021. Any needed typographical for non material matters? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions, edits, suggested changes? All right. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes, 4 0. Thank you. Before I turn it over to um, item number three, just a reminder today that we do have a very robust agenda, all which deserve equal amount of attention. Um, we expect to go into the afternoon. We'll have our community mitigation grant discussion this afternoon. So um, forgive me, but I will try to keep us on the schedule that Marianne with her magic devised for us. And I think commissioners, you probably agree. Um, we want to make sure that we're not so exhausted that we can't give the items um, that Joe present to us the, the right attention. So with that uh, soft warning, um, Executive Director Wells. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, as a preliminary matter, I'd like to start off with a staff introduction. We have a new member of the MGC staff, and I saw her earlier, so I know her camera works. So there she is. Hello. Yeah. So um, we have Marie Claire Flores Peugeot, and I'm, I'm not sure if you go by Marie Claire or Marie. So, um, you know, please let us know. I know you're on mute right now, but um, I just wanted to personally welcome you to the team here. We're very excited to have you on board. I'm going to turn it over to Mark um, uh, to give a just a little bit of an introduction and to explain as research manager for the research and responsible gaming side of the house what you're going to be doing. So welcome and I'll turn it over to Mark. Great. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I am really excited about this. This is, this is uh, I think, a, a great step forward for the Commission and especially for our small research and responsible gaming team. Um, Marie Claire is joining us. Um, she started on Monday. Um, prior to joining us, um, she worked at um, the Center for Substance Use and Addiction in Ottawa, Canada. Um, she did a variety of different tasks there, um, a lot of project management. She's done a fair share of both qualitative
qualitative and quantitative research. Um, she's done um, work in translating um, some of the research that's been done out of that group. Probably the, the most notable project that Marie Claire had done was on um, doing the project management for the development of lower risk gambling guidelines. Um, I've mentioned that to, uh, I think at different meetings, but um, the lower risk gambling guidelines is something that we're really excited to launch later this summer, probably earlier fall, as soon as, as, soon as they're ready. But having Marie Claire sort of um, grounding in that will, I think, be a great assistance to us as we roll those out. Um, at the commission, um, a lot of what I just said that she's been doing at um, in her previous employment, she'll be doing for us. I think the two main things um, are knowledge translation. So how do we take the, the uh, growing body of research we have and mobilize it, make it understandable and plain speech to the stakeholders um, and people that just really need, need to understand it. Um, Marie Claire is also going to um, help me um, in a lot of the contract management and administration making sure that our contracts are, are done on time, make sure that deliverables are arriving, make sure that they're going through the appropriate research review process and make sure that, that they're deployed as soon as they're, they're ready to go. So um, it's, a, a, it's a exciting work, it's a new position and um, I look forward to working with you. Good morning, Marie Claire. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. I am very happy to, to be here. And uh, as it was mentioned, I, from my experience developing the lower risk gambling guidelines, um, I got exposed to some of the uh, great research that's been coming out of uh, Massachusetts, a lot of it from have been very impressed by that. And so um, I'm very happy to be joining the MGC team and uh, I look forward to be working with many of you. Well, welcome. Um, I know that I think probably you're going to be meeting with each commissioner. I know I'm going to see you tomorrow. Um, so we won't go on today about all the questions we have for you. We'll save them for our individual meetings. But commissioners, I think we can all join me in, in a warm welcome to Marie Claire. I'm sorry that it's not in person. And also, I want to note that when Mark said he's very excited, you may not always be able to tell that from the demeanor from in virtual. Mark is very excited about you <laughs> arriving. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you, Karen. Thank you. And so nice to see you. Thanks, Karen. Absolutely. Uh, next, I'm also going to turn it over to Mark. He's going to give us just an update on what he's been doing in conjunction with Singapore and some exciting uh, work they have been doing in collaboration. So I'll turn it over to Mark just to give you an update on that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so I was invited um, for a two year appointment to the Singapore National Council for National <laughs> Problem Handling. Um, they have an international advisory panel. Um, the NCPG is funded by and closely affiliated with the Singapore Ministry of Social and Family Development. Um, so the, the uh, International Advisory Panel, or IAP, um, every couple of years they invite um, just a few people to, to come share their, their knowledge, share their experience, uh, to help Singapore develop um, um, innovative, um, informed, responsible gaming tools and, um, and projects. And so uh, I'm in the middle of my two-year term with, uh, with the IAP. Um, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Sally Gainsbury, um, who is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Sydney, and Paul Smith, who um, used to be with the British Columbia Lottery Corporation. Um, as their director of responsible gaming, but retired and started a group called Sustainable Gaming. Commissioner Zuniga, I know you're you're probably familiar with both of those those individuals. Um, so um, back in I think it was August of 19, um, I was invited to Singapore for a conference that was uh, actually um, sponsored by the Ministry of Social and Family Development, but it kicked off my term with this IAP. Um, 
and in March, uh, I was supposed to return to, to Singapore for the, a seminar for the IAP, but it was held virtually. So every two years that they host a seminar that pulls together um, their uh, casinos that are in Singapore um, uh, and a variety of other government and um, social service uh, agency stakeholders. So um, during the latest um, uh, IAP seminar, I provided a presentation both on our magic study, which was really well received, as well as a, a another study or another project on uh, Play My Way. Um, Play My Way actually uh, was something that I talked about when I was out there in um, 2019. In 2020, um, Marina Bay Sands, which is one of the two casinos out there, launched a program that looks very similar to Play My Way. Um, it's a pre-commitment program. Uh, they call it uh, Know My Play. Um, the other casino um, in Singapore, uh, Resorts World Sentosa, um, in February of 20, and then expanded it in um, February of 21, started a program, again, really similar to, to ours called uh, manage uh, gameplay. Um, you know, I think you know, this this it's a great example of both how um, we're bringing our experience, our expertise to uh, a jurisdiction that's a long ways away, but there's there's um, enough similarities that I think that it translates really well. Um, I think it's also a really good opportunity for us, for me, to have a better understanding of kind of how has other jurisdictions taken some of this technology um, and and really run with it and things that we can learn from it, but also new and innovative things and research that, that are currently underway. Um, I think this is a small enough field um, in terms of responsible gaming and problem gambling that, that we really have an obligation. We really have a great opportunity to learn from one another. Um, and I think our, our relationship with Singapore is a great example of that. Um, you know, there's other examples too. I just, it, I won't go into any detail, but we've been really closely affiliated with um, British Columbia, the British Columbia Lottery Corporation and Play My Way. Um, uh, last month I did um, some consulting or advising, I guess, really um, for uh, Jamaica. Um, and if they're looking at establishing a voluntary self-exclusion program and um, I, I actually did some advising of them uh, a couple of years ago too, pre-pandemic. But um, you know, it's it, again, it's uh, it's a small world. It's a big world, but it's a small world when it comes to some of this work. Um, and as you know, we've also been um, in a variety of ways working uh, with Japan in a variety of settings. And I know Commissioner Zuniga, you you recently did a training for for them, but. We have frequent con contact with them um, on, a, on a lot of different levels um, as they're looking at, um, I think in some ways, mirroring what we've done in Massachusetts and Japan as they launch uh, casino gambling there. So um, that's really just, a, a, I just wanted to provide a quick update. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions from the commissioners? You know, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just make a comment here. Uh, as I look back at um, um, you know the years that we've had since implementing these programs, um, we've seen uh, we're seeing I, I I would submit to everyone a shift in the direction that we took, especially with the tools like uh, Play My Way and Game Sense. In other places, more acceptance toward towards the notion uh, of these of these tools as um, what could be um, um, available for, for players for their for their own benefit completely voluntary um, not re, uh, re, um, recreating some of the mistakes of the past and I think uh, Mark's uh, involvement in places like Singapore and, and, and Japan um, are a great testament to the um, the beginning and, and that shift um, in the industry uh, towards towards accepting those tools. So I'm I'm, I'm really happy that um, 
um, that you continue this work, Mark. Uh, it's a great way to bring back the best practices uh, that are emerging in, in other jurisdictions to, for the benefit of our own programs uh, here, because you say it's a, it's a small community. Um, and as the industry merges into grows really with the online space in, with, um, with all kinds of uh, potentials for expansion, it's incumbent upon us to continue knowing about all those practices. Commissioner Cameron? Yes, uh, uh, Mark, I'm really happy to hear about this relationship. I did not know an awful lot about it um, that you have. And I just, uh, you probably don't remember, but the first year we started a commission, the international conference, the um, IAGRA conference was in Singapore and I did have an opportunity to attend. In particular, I was looking at their investigative methods and um, because we had yet to set up our regulatory model and they were so helpful to uh, the, uh, the folks, the agency there in Singapore, really, really helpful and very, had a very, um, uh, they had thought a lot about how they wanted to regulate in Singapore. Beautiful casinos, by the way, gorgeous. And um, so I'm really happy that you're continuing that relationship and um, and it is, uh, we, at, at this point, we're mature and uh, others can learn from us as well as we continue to learn from the international community. So I, I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Brien, I'll set. Yeah, I'm all set. I, I hope that um, COVID gets under control enough for you, Mark, to actually get over to Singapore, like Commissioner Cameron was able to do. He, he did go in 2019, yeah. right, Mark? Um, yeah, but to get back, that, and that, that's actually how I learned about his um, most recent work, uh, Commissioner Cameron, is um, because I think Mark and I were speaking, getting ready for something, a different program, and all of a sudden he realized that he had miscalculated the time difference <laughs> and had to jump off the call because he suddenly realized he needed to be in Singapore like six hours earlier, right, Mark? Um, it's it's uh, 12 hours difference for Singapore. So, yeah, um, and you had miscalculated. So, yeah. yeah, so if nothing else, being there in, in person takes care of those issues, right? Um, but yeah, I think you're right, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, uh, you know, Mark is recognized internationally as a leader. Um, that's why we are able to um, attract the work of Marie Claire here um, and Mark continues to be such an influential voice so um, I had asked if he would give that update thank you Mark and and you know we will continue to, uh, to to get your updates but we get them often through inadvertently through the research of others and we want to make sure that we are very aware of exactly what you and your division is doing so thanks thanks Karen okay Thank you. Uh, and then the, the last item for the administrative update again is the update from Loretta and Bruce on the uh, COVID protocols and the situation with the casino on site. So I'll start with Loretta and we'll go through that. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, Karen. And uh, good morning, Kathy. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, so consistent with the prior updates that I've given in this portion of the uh, commission's meeting, the three licensees are continuing to abide by and dedicate substantial staff and resources to the health and safety measures put into place by the commission. And this also holds true for those areas of the gaming establishments, in particular the restaurants that are governed by the specifications put into place by the governor's office. Many of the safety measures are forward facing and aim to protect the public. And as a quick review, even before patrons enter, the property's communications plans educate guests on the measures that they will find when they get there. Uh, signage at the entry points directs guests not to enter if they have any symptoms. And of course, hand sanitizer is available throughout, masking is required, no eating in the gaming area, drinking allowed only while seated and actively gaming. Distancing measures and the installation of plexiglass barriers are utilized throughout the properties. Queuing is controlled through signage and floor markings and the enhanced sanitization protocols are in place throughout. 
And of course, it's the employees at each of the properties who have had their eyes and ears on these measures and have been working to ensure compliance with all of this. It has been a serious and a sustained effort on their part. The properties have also been responsible for measures to protect their employees. And on that front, the same measures that are in place for the front of the house have parallel measures in the back of the house. And that starts with communications with employees. I've been informed that, for instance, that shift meetings are utilized to cover reminder information and updated information before the start of uh, employee shifts. Not surprisingly, there have been employees who have contracted COVID-19. The properties have been diligent about their reporting obligations to the Department of Public Health, and they have participated in contact, contract, contact tracing efforts. They've also been proactive in continuing to evaluate in real time whether there are additional measures that can be implemented to protect employees. As an example, at one point, there were multiple cocktail servers at Encore that were contracting COVID and the property installed plexiglass between the server stations in the kiosks that there uh, where the servers uh, get the beverages. And that is uh, one example of the type of uh, real-time evaluation that all three of the properties have been uh, putting into place. The infection rates in the employee populations have always reflected the larger trend in Massachusetts, and that holds true now. Currently, the rate in the employee population is trending downward, uh, consistent with the statewide trend. Uh, the IEB and you as a commission have directed the licensees to continue to assess their measures, the, public facing ones and the employee facing ones. Uh, one update I can give you is that Encore intends to transition away from the non-touch thermal imaging cameras it has used at the public entry points and instead utilize those staff who've been monitoring those stations to assist with social distancing, mask enforcement, and ensuring that patrons are seated while drinking. This is within the property's ability to do. I think it's appropriate and note that the employees have been instrumental in maintaining patron compliance with the measures. The main point I want to make is that the licensees and that the employees have worked and are continuing to work really hard uh, in this challenging environment. Uh, there's also uh, the vaccination site that is now open at Encore. It's being run by the Cambridge Health Alliance. It's an appointments-based site available to residents and also a convenient way for Encore employees to receive vaccinations as well. Um, finally, we're aware that the governor recently released information easing restrictions and setting out a timeline for further easing of restrictions subject to public health data. Karen already has a meeting on the calendar, I think next week for our internal restart working group so we can begin to prepare and work in conjunction with the licensees to frame issues for your consideration and potential votes in the weeks ahead. Um, so those are my prepared remarks. I'm happy to try to address any questions you may have. I know that Bruce is also on the call. I know he's prepared to uh, give a, uh, an operational uh, update. Uh, so uh, let me know how you want to proceed. Before we move on to Bruce, why don't we address Loretta's report? Any questions for Loretta? Um, I, I have a question about the, the employee vaccination numbers. Is there anything that uh, Encore is trying to do to incentivize their employees to uh, get vaccinated, be it at their own site or otherwise? I am aware that Encore is uh, taking the management of the appointment system for their employees. Uh, they are managing that for their employees. They are certainly encouraging uh, vaccination of their employees and are taking the proactive management role uh, in that uh, and making it available uh, to them. 
Uh, so, you know, I don't know the particulars if they are incentivizing it with, you know, time, uh, uh, time off or ability to do on their shifts, uh, but um, I know that they want their employees to get vaccinated and are, are taking a proactive role in making that happen. Okay, thanks. Anything else, Commissioner Bryan? No, that was it. Okay, Commissioner Zuniga, do you have a question for Loretta? Uh, yeah, um, Loretta, uh, tell me if, if you know this or, or, or can get back to, to the next update, but um, you mentioned uh, the governor had outlined some um, steps um, um, recently for, for reopening in anticipation of all the, you know, and, and subject to the data continuing to trend the way it has been trending. Um, but what, um, what might it mean uh, for, for casinos, for our licensees in the short term? Um, maybe some lifting of the occupancy restrictions or are there other, other things concretely that you know might be in the short term horizon? So for the restaurants, the licensees have always followed the governor's guidance. So any changes that the governor has implemented around uh, occupancy for the restaurants, the licensees can adopt those uh, on, based on the governor's directives. Uh, the governor did set out a timeline for the lifting of capacity restrictions around the August 1st date for businesses but the licensees are op operating on the commission's requirements on capacity. So the commission would need to act uh, on, those, on those measures. And that's why Karen has convened the working group so we can uh, start preparing and uh, presenting information uh, to you to uh, make appropriate uh, votes and changes as, as you see fit. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, perhaps um, the the last step of the governor's uh, plan for reopening the phase, I guess, phase four, when there's bars and nightclubs, etc. None of that is yet um, allowed to reopen, but the implication would be similar to restaurants. If and when that was uh, allowed, the licensees may be in a position to reopen that those operations is that a fair statement uh, that would be that would be a fair statement um, uh, although for some of the bars and nightclubs those fall under the commission's restrictions as well so you would need to consider those you know in the context of what the governor has done and any uh, particular needs of uh, of the casinos or issues you know safety issues that, that are posed by the casinos themselves Thank you. Commissioner Cameron, questions for Director Lilios. No questions, thank you. Uh, as always, comprehensive report. Yeah, and good news, correct, Commissioner? We're, we continue to appreciate the, the vigilance. Um, and, and again, you know, we had the news of, I believe, last week at our Monday meeting, which was a little bit of an exception, we had learned that the um, Encore Boston Harbor had been designated a vaccination site. And it is um, great when our licensees are able to be such good community partners um, with the city of Everett and in the region. So uh, again, good, good work on their part. I'm sure they'll be reporting to us on it at some point as part of their quarterly report. Okay. And then Bruce, yep. operations. Hi, Sharon. Uh, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, mine is mostly on occupancy. Uh, on all three properties, the uh, uh, high occupancy rate was May 1st. Uh, this is since our, our last meeting. Uh, on May 1st, MGM had an occupancy rate of 21%. They had a car giveaway again. Uh, PPC's occupancy rate, which was on uh, the Kentucky Derby Day, was 15%. Uh, and Encore on uh, May 1st had a uh, occupancy rate of uh, 19% and they had some slot giveaways. I will say since the governor's announcement, uh, our questions about when poker is opening up in this state has increased probably by 30%. Uh, 
uh, everybody's asking us when we're opening up, uh, but that was kind of expected uh, uh, when his uh, uh, statement came, came out. Just to keep you aware that those questions keep arising. They had quieted down when both of the casinos had posted on their websites uh, the status of poker at their casinos. Karen, that makes sense to put that on the restart committee's agenda. Um, if there's any, I don't know if there's any formal requests from the licensees, but not, not at this point, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Did I hear correct that it was PPC was 15 percent? Correct. Thanks. Uh, the the number day. seems a little bit lower because yeah. we found a, a flaw in their accounting system, and this has corrected it a little bit. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any questions for Bruce? I had one question, Madam Chair. Uh, Bruce, I know I just saw the notification uh, that you sent around regarding Pennsylvania going back to full occupancy a uh, Memorial Day weekend. Right. Um, I wondered if you knew, and you may not know, um, whether our numbers are a bit lower than some of the other states. Um, I don't mean the occupancy rates, I mean the attendance itself, the percentage of patrons that are, are coming back. I just don't know if you have an idea of where it's uh, similar or if we're- From what I, I hear from some of my contacts, they're, they're pretty similar. Uh, okay. and those contacts are Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and, and some of that we're getting similar numbers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any, yeah, Loretta, Director Lilios, anything further or um, for Bruce or you? No. Nope. All set. Loretta, you're all set. All set. Thank you. As always, thank you. And, and again, I think this is, um, these are reports that we should continue to have. So thank you. Executive Thanks. Director Wells. So that concludes the administrative update. We're ready to go on to the quarterly report from MGM. Okay. Great. Um, so we'll move on to item number four. Uh, good morning, Chief Delaney. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we up before you, we have uh, MGM's first quarter report. Um, and from MGM, we have uh, with us Seth Stratton, Vice President and Legal Counsel, uh, Daniel Miller, uh, Director of Compliance, and Arlen Carvalho, the Executive Director of Finance. And with that, I will turn it over to Seth. Actually, Joey, it will be me introducing. Sure. Um, but, uh, good, good morning, late Lady Chair, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for having us before you today to present our Q1 report. Um, I believe we have our IT kinks worked out now, and I'm going to be able to share this with you. So, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm standing by with a copy just in case. I appreciate that, Joe. <laughs> All right, can everybody see uh, the, the PDF uh, of the uh, slides? And I'll put it into- uh, uh, We're all set. All set, Daniel, good morning. Thank you kindly. All right, let's quickly put that into full screen mode. Here we are. All right, so without further ado, I will turn over to Arlen uh, to deliver our uh, revenue taxes and, and lottery compliance portions of the, of the slides. Arlen, are you there? Arlen, would you be on mute or? Yes. I'm not even, uh, Arlen, I'm not seeing her. I've got to see if I can track her down. I'm looking as well, Madam Chair. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not seeing her. Okay. Um, is she on? Is she attending by phone, perhaps? Because um, if Arlen, if you can hear us and you're on phone, try a star six. Correct, Karen? Yes. Star six. Yeah. If if we can't get her, then I'm I'm happy to go through the slide, but may not be able to uh, offer many answers if you have questions. Yes. So um, do, you, can I, do you confirm that Arlen is attending by phone? Bear with me. 
because Austin might be able to help unmute her um, if we have the phone number. If Austin's hearing me. Or I could even try. I have asked her through message if she if she's on. We'll we'll see what the response is. Um. Okay. Seth. No, I was just going to say, Dan. I, well, one, I was looking for a number, but Dan, why don't you go ahead and then, if you want to walk through, and then if there is are any questions, we can hopefully get on them and call in, or we can um, answer okay. them ourselves. Certainly. So uh, clearly looking at the slide, um, you know, for our first quarter uh, gaming review for January, um, just uh, under 14 and a half million with taxes of 3.6 million to the state. Um, and working into February, 16 point, almost 16.9 million in revenue with 4.2 uh, million to the state. And then of course, I uh, had a very good uh, March, uh, which was, you know, presented out uh, publicly by yourselves. Um, since uh, our best month, I believe, since May of 2019, um, where we uh, had a revenue of 22 million um, and was able to uh, pay five and a half million in taxes to the state um, for totals of 53 and a half million uh, as the quarter's revenue and then 13.3 million to the state in tax. Um, I did just see a message uh, from Arlen saying that she's online. Um, so let me see if she can either unmute herself or uh, speak. Hi, sorry. There she is. There she Hi. is. Good Hello. morning, Erin. Hi, good morning. Um, Dan, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where you were at, but I can just go through um, the entire slide for our gaming revenues. I, I, did, go, I did go through the slide j just at the okay. end as you, as you jumped on. Um, if the commissioners have any questions, I will defer them to you too. <laughs> Arlen may want to repeat the gaming revenue for the March. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Our total gaming revenue for the month of March was 22.1 million and our total taxes were 5.5 million. Um, ending the entire quarter at 53.5 million in gaming revenue and total taxes of 13.4 million. Yeah. Thank you. We didn't want Dan to get to take away that good news for you to share. <laughs> it, uh, do you want us to hold our questions? Would that be most helpful, um, Dan or, or Seth? Okay, we'll, we'll wait for questions to the end of the presentation. Sure. Thanks. I'll move on to the next slide for you, Arlen. Correct. Yes, please. Okay. Um, total lottery sales for the three months ending in March of 2020 equal $283,000. That's it. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, it's back to me for compliance. Um, so looking at the table as we provide it regularly, um, you know, with January being the, the highest month of, of those being able to gain access, um, the, the one outlier being the minor that was intercepted gaming, um, that was one of the incidents that the commission has already um, given out the, the penalty related to and previously. Um, so that was one of those particular incidents. But um, I'm, I'm very happy to see the way we're trending clearly with all of the zeros that are on that screen. Um, and then just to give a little background on the, the other um, incidences where there was just gaining access to the floor. Um, those happen to be families with children that had just finished dining at Chandler. Um, and then as they exited, they stepped onto the floor or they went through the floor to exit. Um, we, we've remedied that in a couple of fashions. One is we have now chosen Chandler as, as a location that will be 21 and over. Uh, and if there were to be any very rare exceptions to that, um, then a family would be met by a security officer at the valley entrance, escorted round on the tile. Um, they would obviously um, experience their dining. And then toward the end, it would be down to the restaurant to let security know again they need to be escorted back. Um, and then there's one last redundancy. If security were busy, it would be on one of the restaurant staff to walk them back around through the tile. So, but that, like I say, should be a very, very rare occasion. Um, and, and, and we'd have to monitor whether we feel that's worth the, the time anyway. So, um, but overall, like I say, as you can see, we're, we're trending in the right direction. 
Now, uh, regarding our, our spend update, um, of course, I would usually hand this back to Arlen. Um, the reason I'm not th this, this time around is, sadly, we have found a bit of an error uh, in our numbers here. And uh, I did go over this with Joe yesterday. Um, he, he also brought to my attention that the numbers didn't look correct based on other quarters presented to you. And so we, we, we noticed the same. With your permission, what we would like to do, um, we believe this is due to a, a, an accounting system conversion. Do a deeper dive offline, get the correct information to commission staff. Um, and then ultimately, when we're before you again for our Q2, report on both quarters at the same time so that we can show a, a better comparison. Um, I know you said about leaving questions at the end, Chair Lady, but you might want to respond to this one, just so I know we're, we're good to continue. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm happy to have, I know that there'll be questions on this slide. I'm happy to, uh, to have commissioners, um, in, in, if, if it's helpful, commissioners to ask questions now. The only reason why I don't love that is I can't see faces, Dan. So why don't, as long as we can always go back to the, um, the, the chart. Thank you. Then we can, I can navigate the uh, question and answering a little bit better. All right. Thank so, you. so yeah, so we, we know that um, as you look at this slide as it sits, this information is, isn't correct. Um, and we understand that looking at it just on face value would, would probably need us to pick your jaws up off the floor. So we understand that and we'll, we'll move forward. So um, in, into, in, into employment, I'm also now going to play the part of Jason Randall, our director of HR. Just imagine me about a foot taller and dark brown hair, uh, <laughs> if you would. Um, and so uh, numbers I feel, you know, to, to focus on here would be the, the total number of employees uh, for this quarter where it has increased by roughly 80 team member numbers. Um, as you can see, other numbers have, have pretty much stayed the same from a percentage standpoint. Um, and unless there are any objections, I can move to the next slide that shows uh, our commitments on the, the um, minorities, the women based, the veterans. Um, that will show that as well. But uh, the, the numbers are, are sitting very, very maintained right now. Um, not a huge influx in one way or the other, um, but I'm glad that we are welcoming uh, team members back. And what I'm very much looking forward to is what we'll be able to provide to you for the Q Q2 report um, in, in bringing members back. Um, we have to remember that this particular quarter still included January, which we were still under curfew for for most of that time period. Um, but uh, now as, as things are lifting, of course, we, we, we can continue in the right vein. So. I think at this point, finally, I can hand it off. You don't have to hear me anymore. I, I give you, with no ado, our VP and legal counsel, Seth Stratton. Thank you for that very exciting introduction, Daniel. Um, if, you could, yes. if you could skip to the next slide, thank you. Yes. So we had one primary community engagement event, which we we're very proud of in, in Q1. Um, we've had a long-standing partnership with AMR, um, who is the first primary first responder in Springfield and um, ambulance operator. Um, they also um, have been doing, uh, for months now, um, have been doing the COVID testing uh, at the Eastfield Mall, which is the primary free COVID testing in Western Massachusetts. Um, car lines, you know, sometimes miles long, um, several hours wait in the peak periods, and their staff had been out in the cold um, uh, doing testing hour after hour, day after day. And so we partnered with AMR to provide a warming tent, um, to provide somewhere where they could take a break, um, have their lunch uh, in, a, in a warm environment. Um, and we partnered with Paul Picnelli who provided the lunches, we provided the, the tent, and it was very well received by AMR and, and the staff, and we were happy to do that. And we, um, we were able to do that for several weeks um, as, a, as a thank you to, to their efforts. Um, so um, we, you know, we look to continue to do things um, like this, and we're, we're happy to report. Um, we'll be looking forward to reporting some of the community engagement that we've now, as the warm weather has come um, and we've um, added employees, we'll continue to um, engage in the community as we have in the past. And uh, thanks, next slide. Um, so 
this is some of the fun stuff um, I always get to report on. Um, <clears throat> we have been in somewhat of a pause, obviously, over the past year, but um, there's, I think, exciting movement um, on all fronts. 31 Elm in particular um, is, is moving forward. The city uh, finished its work. It's my understanding based on conversations both with the city of Springfield and the developer uh, that the financial close and the transfer of the commands of the property to the developer will be happening um, uh, in Q3 uh, this summer. Um, and that will allow, once the property is conveyed, that will allow the developer to move forward in earnest with, with their work. Um, we're excited to see um, at the prospect of seeing construction workers and, and movement on that site across, across State Street from us. And we think it'll be a huge, have a huge impact in downtown Springfield. Wahlburgers uh, is on track for a May 2021 20, opening. I know we're in May, so I, I'm, I'll leave it to Wahlburgers to announce their official opening date and, and the public relations announcement around that. But it's our understanding that um, we are on track for a, a May 2021 20, opening and we're very excited about that. Um, a lot of buzz in the community, positive buzz for that opening. Uh, and then with respect to the armory, uh, still under evaluation uh, in terms of the use um, based on the phase lifting of COVID restrictions over the next several months. Uh, as I believe the commission's aware, we had a very successful comedy club um, in that building in the past. Um, as we look toward the post-COVID environment um, and what the restrictions will be going into the fall, um, we're, we're evaluating uh, a number of different, um, you know, prospects for that space, but haven't landed on any firm programming as of this date. And that completes my update. Um, I think, yes, Daniel, if you remove the, the slides and any of the three of us can be available for any questions on any of the material presented. Commissioner Cameron, it looks like you're ready to speak. I am. Um, Daniel, question about, um, I, I noticed obviously that the gaming revenue, which is a good thing, increased in, in particular in March, but the lottery sales went down. Any, any idea why that would, would happen? I will put that over to Arlen if, if she has uh, insight on that. Hi, um, good morning. Um, I don't have direct information as to what I think is causing this. But I think it has to do with the change in games. Uh, so the lottery has been going through changing some of the games that are in the kiosk, which as the inventory moves, it tends to some days um, we'll have slots with no games as the inventory is changing. So I think that's causing the delay in, in sales. Um, but we are getting kind of new games and I think we're good to go um, now. Uh, but I'll monitor over the next couple of months, see um, where the decline is happening. Great, and, and Arlen, I, um, I hope when you work on that rounding error or whatever the problem was there, we see some better diversity spend numbers. That was uh, somewhat jaw-dropping. And um, you know, as your spend, overall spend, biddable spend increases, uh, it would be nice to see that uh, diversity and uh, spend increase with it. So I'll wait for that report uh, at the next quarterly report. Thank you. Kurt. No problem, thank you. And it was in seeing those numbers that we started digging and found the, found the issue. So it's it's important to us as well. Okay. Other questions? Um, I, I would like to just follow up on that. It, Arlen, um, I, I'm, forgive me if I, if I, I'm sure you have worked with Director Griffin, um, but given that, as I think uh, Commissioner Cameron said, I was a little jaw dro dropping, uh, it might be helpful in the, the interim for the two of you to connect, um, Director Griffin, and uh, just to to make sure that we're understanding the uh, the numbers as we move forward over the next couple of months, because uh, we'll we'll see this report in the next quarter. Um, does that make sense? Yes, and sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, but I was saying I can facilitate that. So. Okay, excellent. I um, thank you. Uh, if you haven't worked with Director Griffin Erlen yet, you're in for a treat. So good. Yeah, I did have uh, the chance to connect um, with her earlier um, as an intro, so I'll definitely be happy to to work uh, 
with yeah. her as we move forward. Yeah, and then she can just keep us updated on the um, the corrections. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you. I can I can a couple of questions on that is when you come back in, in terms of the next quarter, um, what I would also love to see just in terms of context is you, you go back so much as into sort of the prior quarters to go back a year, uh, but I'd love to see sort of the year over year since you've opened the stats um, in terms of both diversity in hiring and diversity in spending, just contextually to see trends. I mean, obviously 2020 is not much of a comparison given what happened. So it'd be very helpful for me anyway to see at least the 2019s, your, you know, your first full year there and, um, and talk too about, I know we've talked about this also, but maybe in a little more discussion too, when you're bringing people back in as we reopen, um, you know, trying to get the women back in um, to get that number up. It was, you know, slowly going down and, and I know you're aware of it and have taken some efforts, but uh, maybe if you can address that a little more specifically when you come back for the Q2. I will definitely get with HR as well to make sure that one, they're available for the next one, and two, that uh, we, we do, uh, you know, speak to what you're asking. So thank you, Commissioner. Great, thank you. I know that Director Griffin had uh, compiled, at least for me quickly yesterday, the year-over-year um, uh, -year diversity spend. So uh, that might be helpful to compare notes on that. Okay. Um, other questions for this good report? A, a big thank you to MGM for its role in the COVID testing. Again, um, you know, the, your, these casinos are of such great scale in their communities and they um, have the capacity to be able to play this important community link and they've demonstrated that. Uh, not only do they have the capacity, but they have the willingness. So thank you to all at, at MGM for that. Okay. So the, the lack of questions is not a lack of interest. Just thank you for the thorough report. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Scrolling back to the agenda then. Um, Moving on to item number, yikes, sorry everybody. Um, item number uh, five, licensing division and uh, division chief um, Skinner, Nakisha, are you, there you are. Here Good I am. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and commissioners and, and everyone. Um, I, I just, I wanna start by, by thanking Seth um, for his note about uh, the Wahlburgers uh, sort of surprise grand opening, I was all set to, to, to share that and <laughs> spill the beans as part of my uh, second item uh, on, on the agenda. And so um, I'll be careful not to now that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have two matters for your consideration today, um, both involving MGM Springfield. The first, item is a request to exempt uh, their graphics designer two position from the service employee licensing requirements. The position works with the creative management team at MGM and is responsible for designing newsletters, articles, posters, brochures, um, and also video filming and editing. It's an administrative position and has no managerial or supervisory responsibilities. Um, it has no interaction with the gaming floor, and therefore no access to secure back of the house areas. No access to confidential or sensitive information. Um, and all these factors support approval of the position graphics designer to as uh, an exempt service employee position. And it's my recommendation that the commission approve MGM's request, um, provided I can satisfy any of your questions, answers, answering any of your questions. Questions for Nikisha. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah. Um, Chief, uh, it's nice to call you that, Chief Skinner. It's a, it's a, it's a language that I'm very familiar with. Um, I, I, I think this is exactly in line with other exemptions we made, and I appreciate the thoughtful research going back over the factors that were considered important in determining whether or not a position is exempt. So I, 
I find this one to be uh, certainly in line with others and, um, um, and, and agree with the work of, of your team. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seems to me um, this is exactly the kind of role that you imagined when um, the factors were considered. So um, you do need a vote for this, correct, Chief? Yes. All right, do I have a motion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to move that the commission exempt the graphics designer two position at MGM Springfield from registration requirements in accordance with 205 CMR 134031B for the reasons discussed here today and described in the commissioner's bill. Second. Any questions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. I see the tail. Yes. Um, <laughs> Comm <laughs> Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, so four zero, Vivian, on that. Thank you so much. Commissioner Zuniga, I'm gonna warn you, you're coming in a little slow. So we'll, um, we'll keep track of you to make sure you don't freeze on oh, us. Really? I feel as though we're all um, ch challenged right now with our, our systems. Uh, maybe it's the overtaxing of the homes here. So, but we could hear you clearly. Commissioner Zuniga, it just wasn't your normal cadence. Okay, um, yeah. Then we're all set on that, but you do have another item for us, uh, Chief Skinner. That's right. The second item is a gaming beverage license amendment request uh, involving Wahlberger Springfield LLC. Um, that's located in a standalone building on MGM property. It was uh, uh, up on one of the slides we saw just a little bit ago. Um, it'll be a new licensed area for MGM um, with Wahlbergers as a jointly responsible person. Uh, the Gaming Agents Division conducted an inspection of the premises, which included a review of the areas where the alcoholic beverages will be stored and secured. And they're satisfied that the premises and all of its conditions uh, meet MGM's surveillance, I'm sorry, MGC's surveillance, security, and integrity standards. MGM and Wahlburgers have agreed to observe all COVID restrictions as they remain in place, serving alcohol to seated patrons only and not at the bar service area depicted in the floor plan. So I'm happy to recommend the commission approve the request to amend MGM's gaming beverage license. Um, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm also, <laughs> I'm not gonna reveal the, the grand opening, but um, that, that is expected uh, sometime at the end of the month. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have uh, about the request itself or any of the material in your packet. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Yes, I did have one question with regard to this license. Um, I know that this is a joint responsibility between MGM and Wahlburgers to um, to make sure that they are in compliance with all of our regulations. Um, is, has there been conversation with the new Wahlburgers team? Are they, do they, this may be new for them, right? To be part of a casino property. Do they understand their responsibilities as a joint party, would you say? I, I would say they absolutely do understand. Um, the Wahlburgers team, both MGM and the Wahlburgers teams uh, have been very responsive to the requests that come out of licensing and IEB. Um, they uh, are still, trying to work very hard to get their staffing um, prepared and ready to go, licensed um, as appropriate, ready to go for their soft opening um, and then their grand opening. And so um, they, they do understand um, uh, what their requirements are and, and how seriously MGC takes their role as jointly responsible person. Um, Daniel and I have been in, in contact, close contact over the past um, couple of weeks to make sure that things are just so before uh, things are set to open. And even before, you know, I was uh, comfortable presenting uh, a recommendation to the commission. And I appreciate uh, Daniel for that. Thank you. 
And uh, if there are any questions too, I know uh, Bruce is, right now he's not here in live, but Bruce and team worked in close coordination with, with um, Chief Skinner. There's, there's Bruce too, right, Nikisha? Um, the, I think um, the, one of the challenges is that it's a standalone building. It's, uh, um, it almost looks like it's not part of the uh, gaming establishment, correct? Commissioner, I see you nodding your head. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> any questions for Nikisha or Bruce on that? Other than so, this is Loretta. If I could jump in, and Gail, you do raise a a, a good point about Wahlburgers. It's the I believe it's the first casino environment that they are associated with, and although they are not uh, directly connected uh, to uh, say the gaming floor by any means, they are a vendor uh, to the casino, and they are subject to their employees will be subject to the registration requirements and, and so. So we have uh, met virtually, of course, uh, with their general counsel and with uh, their operational folks. Uh, Nikisha has been, as she alluded to, in close touch with them about what the registration requirements for their employees mean. Uh, and she has coordinated closely with uh, Bruce and Angela and the on-site team around inspections. So I think the uh, communication is in, in place. I think they have every reason to be aware that this is a different environment and uh, have the information they need to make it a successful, uh, a, a successful endeavor. Thank you. A com much. compliant endeavor. Yes. Well, Nikisha has made a, a strong recommendation. Do we have a, um, if there's no further discussion, do we have a, a motion? Madam Chair, I'm happy to move that the commission amend the gaining beverage license issued to Blue Tarp Redevelopment LLC to add the Wahlburgers location depicted in the commissioner's packet, including all of the particulars contained in the submitted application as a new licensed area. Second. Thank you. And I didn't mean to um, shorten discussion, but there's an opportunity now for any further questions. All set. Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. <coughs> Excuse me, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. 4-0. Excellent work. Thank you, um, uh, Nikisha. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you. So uh, that concludes all of your work today, correct, Chief Skinner? You're all set? Oh, she went mute. I'll, I'll set. I'm all set, sorry, thank you. Oh, okay, excellent, then we can move on to, thank you, item number six. Um, good morning, Dr. Lightbaum. Good morning. Um, today we have on the agenda the uh, approval of the quarterly local aid payments, and for that I'll turn it over to uh, Chad Bork, our financial analyst. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning. Chair and Commissioners. Um, so as Alex mentioned, I have today the <coughs> local aid requests for the quarter ending March 31st. Uh, these are payable to each city and town where racing operations are conducted. Uh, I do want to make a, a quick note um, that um, on July 2nd of uh, last year, the Commission did approve the minimum standards for return of live racing and simulcast wagering, which um, helped out the, the handle for this. So um, it was uh, nice to be able to, to pay out a little bit more. Uh, so the amounts for this quarter were calculated using handles from July, August, and September of 2020. And that said, the amount for the city of Boston is for $183,621. 23 cents. The town of Plainville would receive $41,133.46. The town of Raynham would receive $23,059.09. And the city of Revere would receive $91,809.24. Uh, that, that totals for uh, this quarter of $339 thousand six hundred twenty three dollars and two cents 
And in your packet, I, I provided a breakdown of uh, all the handles and calculations for each city and town. And this does ask for a vote. Questions for Chad or Dr. Lightbound? Uh, always very clear presentation, Chad, and, and good news, right, for the, yeah. the community. So um, an, important, an important report. Uh, you do need a vote, so if I could have a motion, please. Um, certainly. Madam Chair, I move that the Commission authorize the local aid payments to Boston, Plainville, Raynham, and Revere, and the amounts reflected in the memorandum included in the Commissioner's packet and discussed today. Second. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Did, uh, oh. Aye. And I vote uh, yes. Aye. Th we, we, yes, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. And, and I vote yes, so we have four zero for that, Vivian. Thank you. Um, so with that, you're all set now, Dr. Lightbound. Our, um, we can report that is, we are slightly a, in, ahead of schedule. Um, and and Marianne um, has suggested that at this time we take a short break. Does this make sense before we go to budget or do we want to go straight on to, uh, um, oh no, it's actually uh, the next report will be from IEB. I don't know if I see Kate right now. Why don't we go ahead with our five minute break? Does that make sense, Commissioner? Oh, there she is. It's right there. Yeah, she's right there. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, I'm gonna to turn to you. What was, what's your preference? Break now or go on to suitability? Um, five minute break, not much. Let's, let's hear the suitability report. Okay, all righty then. Um, what I, what I, what I, it's up to you, I'm, I'm okay. Okay, no, you know what, that's, that's fine. Why don't we go ahead and then we'll be sticking kind of to our, our calculated time. Uh, good morning, Kate. Uh, it's good nice morning. to see you. It's nice to see you too, Chair and Commissioners. Good morning, everybody. Um, I do have um, a corporate qualifier for your consideration this morning. It's Ms. Harper Coe uh, for Plain Ridge Park in her role as Executive Vice President, Chief Legal Officer, and Secretary at PNGI. Uh, Ms. Co has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB conducted its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers and confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, and verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and also conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases as part of the investigation. The team of investigators assigned to this background investigation was Trooper John Morris of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator Fei Zhu. They're joining me on the call should there be any questions. Uh, on April 7th of 2021, Ms. Coe was interviewed uh, using virtual technology, similar to what we're using today. Um, and she was interviewed uh, by both Trooper Morris and Ms. So. Uh, she was noted to be cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of this investigation. And during the interview, Ms. Coe provided uh, her personal history and career path. Uh, she obtained an undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan. This was a bachelor's degree in psychology as a natural science and was obtained in 1995. Following obtaining her undergraduate degree, Ms. Coe worked as a paralegal in New York City for a year prior to attending law school. She received her Juris Doctorate in May of 1999 from the Chicago Kent College of Law. And upon completion of her law degree, Ms. Coe took a position for a brief time uh, with the law office of Kenneth Mall, which is located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, she left uh, that firm to pursue a, pursue a position with WMS Gaming Incorporated, a firm also located in Chicago. And at WMS, she worked as a staff attorney, primarily in commercial transactions, and this was her first introduction into the gaming field. After four years at WMS, Ms. Coe moved to Las Vegas, and in August of 2004, she was hired by Aristocrat Technologies. Uh, you may be familiar with Aristocrat as a vendor uh, for the Gaming Commission. She joined Aristocrat as Associate General Counsel, uh, and she worked there in commercial transactions as well. In July of 2006 until October of 2007, uh, after leaving Aristocrat, Ms. Coe worked for Harrah's in a contract capacity. She was a contract attorney primarily working on commercial transactions for Harrah's. 
uh, later in 2007, this co-joined Valley Gaming Incorporated, now known as Scientific Games, another name with which uh, the commissioners may be familiar. She joined Valley as Assistant General Counsel and remained with Valley during its acquisition by Scientific Games, which occurred in the fall of 2014. In 2017, Ms. Coe left Scientific Games as Deputy General Counsel and then joined Every Payments, another vendor for the Gaming Commission. She joined Every Payments as their Executive Vice President and General Counsel. And uh, Every is licensed uh, currently as a primary gaming vendor in Massachusetts. And in her role at Every, Ms. Coe helped guide the company through its ongoing transition to a full time casino gaming equipment and payment solutions provider. It should be noted that the IAB previously performed a suitability background review of Ms. Co and deemed her suitable on June 6 of 2019 as a qualifier in connection with Every's renewal license. Uh, after her time at Every, Ms. Co uh, found her current position with Penn National Gaming Incorporated, uh, and this rounds out uh, 20 years of corporate, legal, and regulatory compliance experience in the gaming industry for, for Ms. Co. In her position at PNGI, Ms. Co will be responsible for directing the overall operations and the staff of the corporate legal, regulatory affairs, risk, and compliance teams. She will be responsible for developing, implementing, and managing operational goals and monitoring achievements of performance and profit objectives, and will also provide general advice to senior management and the board of directors on legal and regulatory requirements, corporate governance, um, as well as other matters. She'll also be responsible for all material litigation and transactions in this new role. And her duties will include meeting with the CEO to plan business objectives and develop overall organizational policies to coordinate functions and operations between all of the divisions and departments within PNGI. Uh, at present, Ms. Co uh, has been qualified in several gaming jurisdictions, primarily in her most recent role with every uh, no derogatory information surfaced when we confirmed her current gaming credentials. And Ms. Coe has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that she is suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find her suitable as a qualifier for Plain Ridge Park. And I would need a vote on this if there are no questions for me or the rest of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Questions, commissioners? No, no questions. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, anything? I, I guess my only observation would be that she was deemed suitable um, by IEB in June, correct? Of 2019, correct. Yeah. In, in connection with every. Right, right, connection with every. And we were able to achieve some efficiencies, correct, when we do the investigation? Yes, yes, we were. And I, my compliments to the investigative team in um, leveraging the work that was done by their counterparts previously in 2019. Great. Yeah, thank you to Trooper Morrison. I, I see Faye, good morning, Faye, nice to see you. Um, yeah, Commissioner Cameron. Yep. Madam Chair, I made note of the same point. Uh, first of all, uh, another very clean investigation, but the, um, the timing is, is we are really, uh, and maybe it is due to the efficiencies, but this was done in a very timely manner. And I, during COVID, I do appreciate the team's efforts to get these before us in a timely manner and complete the investigations in, um, in a timely manner. Yeah, it's a thank big goal. So thank, thank you, Kate. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we'll, we'll need a motion for Kate. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move. Um, that the commission issue a positive determination of suitability to uh, Ms. Harper Co. in her capacity as Executive Vice President, Chief Legal Officer, and Secretary to Penn National Gaming Inc. Second. Thank you. Second. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Um, if there are no further comments or questions, then we'll move um, with the roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. Commissioner Zuniga, I want to give you before we, uh, that's 4-0, Vivian, but um, I want to make sure that you're you know you're slightly delayed. If for any reason I move on forward on something, just give me a wave because I'll go back to you. We're just, you're just a bit behind and I don't want you to think I'm cutting you off, okay? 
Thank you. I, I, I can see you really well. I understand that you can hear me a little later, but uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and so if we move on, just wave and, and, we'll, and I'll pause uh, just because I might be slightly ahead of you. Okay, with that, um, commissioners, I think we will take our short break now before we move on to item number eight, um, and that's our budget discussion for today. Um, so why don't we, it's now 1116. Um, we'll come back in, in, in at 1125. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, we'll get started again. Um, um, we're uh, reconvening uh, uh, meeting 343. It's now just after um, 1126. We'll get started. And we have now um, on item number eight of our agenda, uh, Chief Finance and Accounting Officer, uh, Derek, there you are. Good morning with Actually, as much as I loved um, Lisa's backdrop, uh, Derek's backdrop actually gets the grand prize. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for noticing the artwork. A um, lot of work has gone into that. Um, my daughter is very, very talented, and I have some more I have to hang up, so you'll see that growing as we, as we go along here. Um, yeah, it, it challenges uh, Director Wells' stick Sticky note wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are gone. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. These these bring me joy. I think some of those sticky notes brought Karen a little anxiety. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good point. Good morning, uh, the Chief. Let's get started with your um, your report. And of course, Commissioner um, Zunica, you'll be chiming in as well, as well as your team, all present. Correct. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm joined by Agnes Bollier and Douglas O'Donnell, and we are here to update you on MDC's budget uh, after three quarters of activity in fiscal year 2021. The commission approved an initial budget of 32.4 million in the Gaming Control Fund, and an additional 4.6 million from the Public Health Trust Fund for the MDC's Research and Responsible Gaming Program. The budget initially required a $29.67 million assessment on licensees, and after two quarterly updates, the assessment was reduced to 27.6 million. For this quarterly update, we have revisions to both our spending estimates as well as our revenue estimates. However, there is no recommendation for a change to the assessment on licensees. Uh, for the spending side, after three quarters of activity, we're making the following adjustments in the MDC budget, which are detailed in pages one and two of the memo, and I'm more than happy to answer questions on afterwards, but we'll just go over brief bullet points here. Um, we're decreasing the gaming enforcement units budget by 375,000. Uh, we're decreasing our contract employee budget by 100,000. Uh, where the AGO spending is slightly lagging, so we're protect, projecting a reversion of 100,000. Um, and we are increasing the independent monitor budget by 424,000. And this is for the invoices that were paid between January 1st and March 31st. And that's revenue neutral, because you see on the revenue side, we're actually increasing our revenue by the, that amount too. Uh, and then we're increasing the IT budget by 250,000. And this is to help us transition to the cloud and pre uh, provide resources for positions that have been vacant or vacated um, at, in our IT office. On the, uh, the net impact of all these adjustments is an increase of around 119,000. Um, on the revenue side of the budget, we're increasing third quarter revenue estimates by 424,000 for the independent monitor fees. Um, that, as I mentioned before, is a direct offset for the spending. Um, but we're also decreasing revenue estimates for licensing fees by approximately 292,000, which we had told you in the first and second quarter, we were keeping a close eye on that, um, that it was coming in a little lower. And the majority of that's coming from the employee licensing fees lagging. Um, the turnover and hiring rates at the casinos for good reason during, due to COVID uh, continue to be below previous year's rates. Um, but the net impact of the increase for monitoring fees and decrease in licensing fees is 131,000 increase in revenue projections, which 
is higher than the 118,000 impact increase in spending projections. So that's why we're not coming to you um, asking for any change to the assessment. Um, at this point, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. I know we have uh, Agnes and Doug on as well. So if there's anything I can't answer, they'll be able to um, answer for me. Questions for Derek, commissioners. Commissioner Zuniga, do you want to add in? I, yes, um, if I may, um, I think this is a great uh, reflection of um, the prudent practices of Derek and his team. And what he's projecting at this point, uh, what I believe are also prudent decreases and adjustments to the budget line items that he went over. Um, it's also a reflection of a most unusual year in which um, the revenue projections that we had done, um, we had we were been able we had been able to rely on prior years, uh, slow down in the form of the licensing fees because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but the good news in, in in my book is that there's no budget revision. Um, we continue to maintain um, a steady. Um, uh, spending and, uh, and revenue, and um, and I think it's uh, we're in good shape to to finish the year in a similar form. Thank you, commissioners. Questions for Derek or Commissioner Zuniga, mm. I, or no. Doug or Agnes? I see Noel too. Hello, uh, just, hello everybody. This. Is uh, I, I, just a comment, Madam Chair. I just um, I agree with Commissioner Zuniga that um, uh, the prudent practices are obvious, and I'm sure our licensees appreciate that too, as they have um, struggled for revenue. So that we are we are cognizant of that as we as we um, put our budget together. So just thank uh, just a thank you to the team. Um, easy to follow, report, and um, understanding exactly why the recommendations are made as they are. So just to thank you. I, I just want to turn to Executive Director Wells. I don't know if you want to chime in. I, I think that uh, for me, the a notable um, addition is the uh, support right. to give IT. Do you want yes. to comment on that? Yes, that, that I am 100% in support of that uh, position. Our IT team has been uh, working so hard, you know, with limited resources, um, they've had a, uh, to support us in this virtual environment on top of this migration to the cloud, which has been a, really a lot. And uh, putting some resources in there, I think, is a smart move for the agency and a smart move uh, supporting that department. So I'm 100% in support. And I don't know if I see Katrina um, here. Uh, I want to emphasize that many people who look like they're attending are actually working away with an ear to our meeting. They stay available in the event we have questions. Um, and and <laughs> people just turn on their video just now. Um, but uh, um, I, I do know that Katrina and team have been working tirelessly and, and uh, so I um, really endorse that support as well. Um, and for me also, you know, the prudent practices Derek and, and team are so good about uh, not only communicating with the licensees, but keeping us informed along the way. Um, the communication is, is excellent and I appreciate that, Derek, very much. You I don't need a, I don't need a vote today. This is an update for us. And then we'll be going uh, next month into the, the full budgetary approval process, correct? Correct. Um, first meeting in June. We're on target for that um, for our first view of the budget, and then second meeting in June. Hopefully, we'll um, we'll be able to approve it. So the July one, we just roll forward and um, get back to somewhat normal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no further questions, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Then um, uh, Chief uh, um, Lim and uh, team, 
Uh, thank you, and we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Which is, oh my goodness, I'm scrolling ahead. We're moving right into to legal. I'm just looking at the time. Outstanding. Uh, Todd has got a little bit of a grin there. Um, out, outstanding. And Doug, it was so nice to see you. I'm so sorry I didn't say hello. Um, Hi, nice to see you and Agnes. Thank you. See you as well. Thank you. Thank you for your good work. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you for your good work. And now moving on then to General Counsel Brunswick. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning to everybody. Um, if it's okay, uh, Ms. Teresi had to step away momentarily to handle a separate matter. We're prepared to move ahead with 9B if, uh, if there's no objection. Uh, we can pivot into the tribal uh, presentation. And then we'll circle back to A um, as we oh. circle back. Yes. Great. So without further ado, I'd just like to introduce uh, our Associate General Counsel, Caitlin Monahan, who has uh, done a tremendous amount of work uh, immersing herself in this uh, tribal uh, piece of litigation and will offer an overview uh, for you at this time. Uh, like to turn it over to Caitlin. So we're going to go into a PowerPoint, Commissioners. So we'll probably, um, you might want to note your questions and then we'll be convened at the end of Caitlin's presentation for questions. Thank you. Good morning, Caitlin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, I just want to confirm that you can all see that. Yes. Yep. Great. Here we go. Here we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Today we will be providing an update regarding the status of various litigations involving the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe and the Wampanoag Tribe of Bayhead. Before we start, we would like to note that we will not attempt to predict, project, or handicap the outcomes of any of the cases or issues that we will discuss here today. Rather, we intend to provide a factual overview of where each case stands. One of the reasons we are here today is that the Commission has certain obligations regarding tribal matters. In particular, Chapter 23K, Section 67 provides in pertinent part that the Commission shall continue to evaluate the status of Indian tribes in the Commonwealth, including, without limitation, gaining federal recognition or taking land into trust for tribal economic development. The cases we will be discussing today relate to these issues. Before we delve into the substance of the Mashpee Wampanoag cases, we wanted to provide some backgrounds on the law and jurisprudence that underpin them. The first uh, statute we'd like to speak about is the Indian Reorganization Act. In that act, often called the IRA, authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to acquire land and hold it in trust for the purpose of providing land for Indian. But the Secretary's authority under the IRA is cabins whether a tribe meets the statute's definition of Indian which is found in section 19 of the IRA and codified at 25 USC section 5129. As you will hear, the IRA's definition of Indian is a key part of the Mashpee Wampanoag cases. The IRA includes the three part definition of the term Indian, and you can see that set out in this slide. Specifically, the term Indian as used in this act shall include one, all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction, and two, all persons who are descendants of such members who were, on June 1, 1934, residing within the present boundaries of any Indian reservation, and shall further include, three, all other persons of one half or more Indian blood. And the sections of the definition that are highlighted on this slide will be addressed in the Mashpee Wampanoag cases. So as you'll see in the first definition, now under federal jurisdiction is sort of a term uh, that required some explaining. And in the second definition, such members was a term that the cases get, uh, deal with. In 2009, the Supreme Court grappled with the question of how to interpret the statutory phrase now under federal jurisdiction in the IRA's first definition of Indian with a focus on how to interpret the term now in that phrase. And the Supreme Court held that the term now under federal jurisdiction in section 479 unambiguously refers to those tribes that were under federal jurisdiction of the United States when the IRA was enacted in 1934. 
In other words, now means 1934. The majority did not explain, however, how to interpret the term under federal jurisdiction. So in response to Carcieri, on March 12th, 2014, 2014, the solicitor of the DOI issued a memorandum to the secretary entitled The Meaning of Under Federal Jurisdiction for Purposes of the Indian Reorganization Act. This is known as the M opinion. And the M opinion outlined how to interpret the phrase under federal jurisdiction in the IRA for purposes of determining whether an Indian tribe can demonstrate that it was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. The M opinion sets out a two-part inquiry to determine whether a tribe was under federal jurisdiction. The first part of that inquiry looked into whether the United States had taken an action or series of actions that are sufficient to establish or that generally, generally reflect federal obligations, duties, responsibility for, or authority over the tribe by the federal government. And the second inquiry looks into whether the tribe's jurisdictional status remained intact in 1934. As a signed M opinion binds the department and its officials until modified by the solicitor, deputy secretary, or secretary, or is otherwise overruled by the courts. In other words, in determining whether a tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934, the DOI must undertake this two-part inquiry, as is set out in the M opinion. This brings us to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe cases, which we have set out in this slide. As we will discuss, each set of cases starts with a record of decision issued by the Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs regarding whether the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe met one of the definitions of Indian under the IRA. Each decision then led to a separate litigation. The first set of cases, the Littlefield cases, deal with how to interpret the second definition of Indian and whether the tribe met that definition. The second set of cases deal with whether the tribe met the first definition of Indian under the IRA, and specifically whether the tribe was under federal jurisdiction as of 1934. Before we get into the details of these cases, however, we want to give you a brief overview of where they stand today. But don't worry, we'll walk through each of them in more detail momentarily. So the first set of cases is the Littlefield cases, and those took place here in Massachusetts and the District of Massachusetts in the First Circuit. Both of those cases have now concluded. And there are two main takeaways from that line of cases. The first relates to statutory interpretation. And in particular, the court determined that the use of the word such of the term such members in the second definition of Indian includes the complete antecedent members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. In other words, in order to meet the second definition of Indian, a tribe must have been under federal jurisdiction as of 1934. The second takeaway from the Littlefield cases is that the 2015 ROD was flawed. Because the IRA unambiguously foreclosed the BIA's interpretation of the second definition of Indian in the 2015 ROD, the secretary lacked authority to take land into trust for the benefit of the tribe. Again, in other words, because the BIA had not interpreted the second definition of Indian correctly, its decision was flawed. The second set of cases we'll discuss are the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe versus Bernhard cases, which took place in Washington, D.C. Those cases have also concluded. And again, there are two main takeaways from those cases. The first is that the 2018 ROD was also flawed. And in particular, the court found that the, the ROD was arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion, and contrary to law, because it did not evaluate the evidence in accordance with the directives of the M opinion. And because of that, the 2018 ROD was remanded back to the DOI for a thorough reconsideration and reevaluation of the evidence before it. So those RODs remain on remands today, and we are awaiting a new record of decision from the DOI regarding whether the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe meets the first definition of Indian under the IRA, and in turn, whether lands may remain in trust for the tribe. A temporary stay prohibits the DOI from taking any steps to alter the status quo ante with respect to the land in Mashpee and Taunton that was taken in trust in November 2015. And per the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the tribe may not operate an Indian casino without land and trust. So now that you understand where the cases stand today, we can go back to the beginning and get into a little more detail of how we got there. So this brings us to September 2015. 
In September 2015, the Bureau of Indian Affairs issued a record of decision, which we're going to refer to as the 2015 ROD. That ROD announced the DOI's determination that one, it would acquire and trust the land in Mashpee and Massachusetts uh, that were uh, owned by the tribe. It would proclaim these lands to be the tribe's reservation, and the Mashpee and Taunton sites were eligible for gaming under the initial reservation exception of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So there were a number of issues addressed in that ROD, but there are two that we'll discuss today. One is, to what does the term such or such members in the IRA second definition of Indian apply? And does the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe meet the definition of Indian under the second definition of the IRA? The BIA determined that such or such members refers only to members of any recognized tribe, but not the phrase now under federal jurisdiction, which modifies only the first definition of Indian. This is a little bit complicated, so it makes sense to walk through the definitions of Indian, which are set out in full under the first bullet in the slide. As you can see, the second definition of Indian refers to, quote, all persons who are descendants of such members. There was a question of what such or such members referred to. The BIA determined that the phrase such members referred back only to the phrase all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized tribe, but not to the end of the phrase now under federal jurisdiction. So using that interpretation, the BIA found that the tribe met the second definition of Indian. In rendering its decision, the DOI did not determine, however, whether the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934, because it didn't think it needed to. So at that point, the DOI took land into trust for the tribe in November 2015. After the 2015 ROD was issued, a citizen group appealed the land and trust status of the tribe in the federal district court for the District of Massachusetts. That case was Littlefield versus US Department of the Interior. And the issues in that case were the same as the issues in the 2015 ROD. To what does the term such members in the IRA second definition of Indian apply? And does the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe meet the second definition of Indian under the IRA? Judge Young issued his opinion in that case on July 28, 2016. And contrary to the BIA rationale, Judge Young interpreted the term such members to refer back to the, to refer back to the full clause in the first definition. So in other, words, it in other words, it referred back to the phrase, all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. The BIA had not determined whether the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in the 2015 ROD. Therefore, based on the 2015 decision, the tribe did not qualify as Indian under the second definition of the IRA, and the secretary lacked the authority to acquire land and trust. The factual question of whether the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934 was not before Judge Young, however. So upon this finding, Judge Young remanded uh, the, 2015 RO, DO, <laughs> the 2015 ROD to the DOI, with lots of acronyms, for further proceedings. Judge Young also clarified after the fact that on remand, the DOI could analyze the tribe's eligibility under the first definition of Indian or reassess eligibility under the second definition, consistent with the court's ruling on the proper interpretation of that definition. So at this point, the tribe appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. And then on February 27, 2020, the First Circuit affirmed Judge Young's decision. So again, in brief, the First Circuit agreed that the use of such members in the second definition of Indian included the complete antecedent, members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. And the First Circuit also agreed that the 2015 ROD was flawed and appropriately remanded. Then on March 27, 2020, the Secretary of the Interior directed the BIA to rescind the 2015 ROD, whereby the BIA accepted land into trust on behalf of the tribe and to revoke the reservation proclamation. Such action, however, was stayed by the District Court for the District of DC, which we'll discuss in a moment. So in response to Judge Young's remand order, the DOI issued the 2018 ROD on September 7, 2018. And there were also two, issue, two issues addressed in the 2018 ROD that we'll discuss today. The first was, was the tribe under federal jurisdiction as of 1934? And does the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe meet the first definition of Indian under the IRA? 
So now we're switching to the first definition of Indian, whereas in the first set of cases, we were dealing with the second definition of Indian. So applying the M opinion, the DOI concluded that the evidence does not show that the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934 within the meaning of the IRA's first definition of Indian. The DOI also determines that the tribe does not qualify under the second definition as that definition has been interpreted by the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. So the tribe challenged the 2018 ROD in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. You'll note that they could have, cho they could have um, challenged the, the ROD in the District of Massachusetts, but instead they chose to uh, challenge it in D.C., which the court ultimately determined was appropriate. So the issues in that case were, was the tribe under federal jurisdiction as of 1934, and does the tribe meet the first definition of Indian under the IRA? So on June 5th, 2020, Judge Friedman found that the 2018 ROD was arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion and contrary to law because it did not evaluate the evidence in accordance with the directives of the M opinion. Specifically, the judge found that the secretary's incorrect application of the M opinion evaluating the evidence in isolation and failing to view the probative evidence in concert taints every category of evidence that the secretary discussed in the 2018 ROD. He also found that the analysis in the 2018 ROD was inconsistent with the DOI's prior decisions and judicial precedent. So because of this, Judge Friedman remanded the 2018 ROD to the DOI for a thorough reconsideration and reevaluation of the evidence before it, consistent with this opinion the 2014 M opinion, and the department's prior decisions applying the M opinion's two-part test. On the same day, Judge Freeman also issued a temporary stay prohibiting the DOI from taking any steps to alter the status quo ante with respect to the land in Mashpee and Taunton that was taken into trust in November 2015. That stay prohibits the DOI from taking any steps to take the land out of trust or rescinding the proclamation that the trust land is the tribe's reservation. And that stay shall last until 14 days after the DOI issues a decision on remand that conforms with the 2014 M opinion. In other words, that stay is still in effect. On August 7, 2020, the DOI and the citizen group filed notices of appeal of Judge Friedman's decision in the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. Then on February 19th, 2021, the DOI and the citizen group moved to dismiss their appeals voluntarily, and those appeals were dismissed. So that all means that Judge Friedman's June 2020 order stands, and the, the 2018 ROD is flawed and is currently on remand. So both the Littlefield and the DC cases have now concluded, and we are awaiting the DOI's decision on remand from Judge Friedman regarding whether the tribe meets the first definition of Indian under the IRA and in turn, whether the land in Mashpee and Taunton may remain in trust for the tribe. Per the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the tribe may not operate an Indian casino without land in trust. So this brings us to the end of our presentation regarding the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe cases. And our next section is pretty short, so I think it probably makes sense to take questions altogether at the end, if, that, if that's okay with you. Yes, go right ahead, Caitlin, thank you. Thank you. So we will next discuss the status of the Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead litigation. And while that case has quite a long history, we are going to give a brief overview of where it stands today. As you may remember, this is the case in the District of Massachusetts in the First Circuit, in which the parties have disagreed over one, whether federal or state gaming law applies to a gaming facility built by the Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead on Martha's Vineyard, and two, whether the tribe must comply with state and local permitting laws and regulations in the building of a gaming facility. On remand from the First Circuit, Judge Saylor entered a final judgment providing that one, any gaming facility constructed and operated by the tribe on the lands at issue is not subject to state and local laws and regulations concerning gaming, and that any such facility is otherwise subject to state and local regulation, including any applicable permitting requirements. And that, um, decision was entered in 2019. So the tribe appealed the latter portion of that judgment concerning the permitting issue um, because it had already appealed the first part regarding um, whether the, whether the um, casino is subject to state and local laws concerning gaming. 
So then on February 25th, 2021, a first circuit panel affirmed Judge Saylor's judgment, ruling that the tribe had waived its right to appeal the permitting issue. The tribe then moved for a panel rehearing or hearing en banc, but was denied in, on April 5th, 2021. So at this point, the tribe may still petition the Supreme Court for writ of certiorari, and it still has time to do that. Regardless, the tribe may move forward with building a class two gaming facility in line with the aforementioned state and local laws and regulations. And because the tribe intends to build a class two facility as opposed to a class three facility, it does not need a compact with the Commonwealth to do so. So I hope this was an informative presentation for the commission and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Great presentation, Caitlin. I'd love to say it's all clear now, <laughs> um, but I know that the commissioners are going to have questions, and 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 I think commissioners, this is an opportunity to you know ask any fundamental thing here um, if you'd like clarification, and because we have the time, you know, to if you want to build on those fundamental and, and go through a series of questions. Commissioner Zuniga, I see you nodding your head. Would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Caitlin, for that uh, great summary. Um, I know you mentioned the intention is not to handicap, um, you know, what's going to happen next. Um, uh, it's tempting to just remind ourselves of where this stands. And if I, if, if I get this right, it, it, regarding the MASH P Wampanoag, um, it now stays with the Department of the Interior for them, because it's been remanded, um, for them to um, essentially issue another record of decision. That's exactly right, yes. That, ad that addresses the first definition of Indian, which they has, didn't, didn't address the first time around. They're, they only went with the second. Exactly, yeah. But it's now, understood by all by all the process that they should have addressed that that first part and how they address it is going to be key to the match is that a fair statement i think that's very close i think um because the first circuit interpreted you know set out the interpretation of how you need to analyze the first and the second definitions of indian the doi now has an opportunity to do that um, in line with the First Circuit's decision. So yes, what the, what the DOI will presumably do is issue a new uh, ROD in which it analyzes whether the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934, um, and then in turn, whether it qualifies uh, under the first definition of Indian. Right. And there's, there's no indication in terms of timeline what uh, the, the, DO, the DOI will do. We know that it's an administration that's perhaps a little bit friendlier to Indian affairs with the new secretary and the new administration, but there's no um, indication in terms of timing, to your knowledge? No, we have not um, heard of any timeline, but our understanding is that um, the DOI doesn't intend to sit on it. So um, perhaps we'll get a decision soon, but we just don't know. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Cameron, yes. Yes, yes I, I, I agree. Uh, excellent presentation. Very, very uh, helpful and timely for us as a commission. Um, so I, I think what I'm hearing, Caitlin, is that the second definition is really not a standalone, is what the two courts have said, right? You really do have to answer the first for it to be complete, correct? I think that's fair to say. Uh, the way that the BIA had in initially interpreted it, it separated them a little bit more. But based on the First Circuit's decision, um, yes, both definitions require a determination that the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And you mentioned also that the um, the court case, or rather the um, I know the the local neighbors down there were the ones that originally brought that suit, but that has been uh, completed. Meaning, if the BIA does move as as um, they intend to, we just don't know the timing, and they issue a new decision, 
um, that could be challenged again, correct? With but it, they would have to bring a new lawsuit in order to do that. That is correct. Um, I believe they would have to bring a new lawsuit related to the the new ROD. There's a small chance they could try to tack it on to the case related to the 2015 litigation, but practically, I don't think it would have much of a difference in how the case proceeded. Okay. Thank you. Very helpful. You're welcome. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have questions? I don't. Thank you. It was very, very clear presentation, Caitlin. Thank you. My questions were really along the line of Commissioner Cameron's. I'm struggling with um, the initial dis uh, uh, decision on the definition of Indian, and it was really helpful how you presented it. Um, so my understanding is, and I think Commissioner Cameron put it as a standalone, that number two and number three couldn't be a standalone. They're really almost subsumed into um, the definition that's put forth in number one. Um, so if, if logic were extended, then um, number three would be all other persons of one half or more Indian blood now under federal jurisdiction. Is that the logic that would extend or no? So I don't think so because um, would it be helpful if I put the definition back up on the? Yeah, I'm looking at it my other screen, so walk me yeah. through. Not okay. under, yeah. You gotta remember the such persons. Yeah, yeah, it would that's be really the, the one that links the two. Okay, so the first definition is all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction, mm -hmm. right? The second definition then refers back to the first definition, all persons who are descendants of such members, et cetera, et cetera. So, it is, it is abundantly clear now based on the First Circuit's decision that such members refers back to the entire uh, first definition. All persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized tribe now under federal jurisdiction. Mm. That doesn't uh, implicate the third uh, definition. Oh, the third okay. definition is a separate definition, which frankly, we haven't really dealt with in the Mashpee Wampanoag cases. No. Well, and that's really helpful just to walk me back through the language. Good. And then, uh, and then so uh, you know, Cameron um, asked the process question, which we'll have. Go ahead. It's, it's all going to be back on the, the Department of the Interior to address what exactly does under federal jurisdiction mean now, actually, now under federal jurisdiction. Okay. There, interactions with the tribes between the, the U.S. government and the tribes that in 1934 were sufficient and what kind of evidence they would rely on to say that was then under federal jurisdiction. Under federal that, jurisdiction. That's exactly right. And I think um, if you look at the, the DDC case, the DC case, you'll see that um, the DOI had a lot of evidence in front of it related to the interactions between the tribe and the federal government. And what DC, the DC court just said was, you have the evidence, you interpreted it incorrectly. You didn't look at it all in tandem or in concert. You looked at each piece in isolation and tried to determine whether any one piece meant that you were under federal jurisdiction. So basically go back, look at all the evidence again, look at it in concert and come back with you know, a new decision. And doesn't this bring Cartier again altogether because the Supreme Court addressed the under federal jurisdiction then, correct? I mean, you touched on this in your presentation. It, so Cartier was, it, it discussed that phrase, but in effect, it was really limited to the word now, now under federal jurisdiction. And in Cartier, the, oh. the Supreme Court decided that now meant 1934. Mm -hmm. Didn't say what under federal jurisdiction meant, so that was an open question that then went to the First Circuit. You, you see, see that Commissioner Zuniga, and um, I know. I mean, it, I, I've, I've I've tried to stay on top of these, and and you know, it gets it's complicated by the next decision. Every Believe time me, I had to read these yeah. cases a lot of times to, <laughs> to get them all straight in my head. And, and I don't know if this is a fair question to ask because we really 
Um, I want to point out that we're fulfilling a, a commitment, a requirement uh, under the statute, which you led with, uh, Caitlin, and, and thank you, um, uh, Todd and Caitlin, for leading with that, that we, we have an affirmative obligation to really follow the tribe status. So thank you. And as uh, Commissioner Cameron points out, it's timely because with the new administration, there may be no insights. We just don't know. And with that, my second question, um, have at one point there was some legislative proposals. Uh, and Caitlin, are you able to speak to that or? Yes, okay. I am and, and I'll actually reshare. I have a, a slide in the appendix on that. Thanks. Scoot forward here. Sorry. Um, so yes, um, there was federal legislation in January 2019 um, from Representative Keating, uh, and that was a bill titled the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Reservation Reaffirmation Act. And that bill would have reaffirmed the tribe's trust land, ratified and confirmed the secretary's actions taking the land into trust and precluded the filing of further matters and dismissed pending federal litigation concerning the matter. So it basically would have resolved all of these issues in favor of the tribe. Um, that bill was passed uh, in the House in May 2019, and it was received in the Senate, but uh, there was no further activity in the Senate. In the, Senate. the Senate did not pass it. Uh, the 116th Congress then ended, and we're now in the 117th Congress, and the bill has not uh, been reintroduced in the 117th Congress. So we're keeping an eye on that, whether or not the bill ends up being reintroduced, but as of right now, um, there is no active legislation. Very helpful, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Cameron, are you all set? I am, thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And we know it's a good deal of work in, in one of your first um, assignments, Caitlin. So thank you. Very thorough. Thank uh, you. It was a pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at our um, next item. I think we had contemplated lunch now after Caitlin's presentation is is Carrie, I see she's back. So now we could move on to the regulatory matter. Todd. That would be great, thank you. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, we have three sections of 205 CMR 146, which are the gaming equipment regulations on the agenda today for a final vote to complete the promulgation process. Uh, in your packet, you have 205 CMR 146.13 related to blackjack table characteristics, 205 CMR 146.49 related to playing cards, and 205 CMR 146.51 related to dealing shoes and automated shuffling devices. I just wanna note that if you're looking at your packet, it looks like the first page of um, section 51 got cut out somehow, but the, the red line is actually there in the packet still. We didn't lose any of the actual changes, so um, that's still visible there. Uh, these changes are administrative in nature and remove references to the six to five blackjack variation, which uh, we had removed from the rules of the game of blackjack, so this variation no longer exists. These regulations came before the commission on February 25th, and you voted to begin the promulgation process then. A public hearing was held on April 22nd, presided over by Commissioner Cameron, and we received no comments. We've also received no written comments. So we'd be seeking a vote today on the amended small business impact statement, which is in your packet, as well as the regulations to finalize the process and file these with the Secretary of State. Questions for Carrie. process is complete. Um, then we would have um, um, the two-part motion. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, or uh, Commissioner Zunica, it looks like you're ready to go. I was ready to move uh, that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.13. 205 CMR 146. Point four nine, 
and 205 CMR 146.51 as included in the commissioner's packet. Thank you, Commissioner Brian. Any questions on this? All set. We'll go ahead with our roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. So 4 0. Vivian, thank you. In the next part, Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, I I further move that the Commission approve the amendments to 205 CMR 146.13, 205 CMR 146.49, and 205 CMR 146.51 as reflected in the Commissioner's packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the promulgation process. Second. Thank you. Any questions on this part? All right. We'll move forward. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Yes, 4 0. Thank you. Carrie, thank you for your thorough work on this matter. Um, it's completed the process. And again, com uh, thank you to Commissioner Cameron for um, covering that regulatory hearing. Um, just going forward, commissioners. Um, Particularly at some point, we will have an, a new commissioner. I think um, what my plan would be is to have um, us be on a, uh, the commissioners to be on a list, and um, and we'll, it will just be a revolving list to cover for the um, regulatory hearings. I think that's an opportunity for the commissioners to to participate. We often don't get any public um, comments, but it is part of the process. And Carrie and team welcome. The opportunity to to work with with all of us. So, uh, 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 General Counsel Grossman will put that system in place. Probably Jamie will set it up, and and we'll have that coverage just be on a revolving basis. Does that make sense? Great, great. Thank you so much. And if somebody can't cover, then another will cover. We'll just figure it out. Okay. Excellent. So. <laughs> Um, I think if I'm correct, and again, I've got, I've got a little bit of a slide issue here. Um, our, our, our next item is number 10. We are ahead um, of schedule, but it is 12, 13. Should we continue the community? Oh, I see Commissioner Zuka no. saying no, lunch. Commis no, I think uh, lunch break would be appropriate. <laughs> Okay, we've got that. That's what I wondered. So we're ahead on our lunch break um, here in a better place than 120, right? So um, we'll have our lunch now, and it is 12:15, half hour. Is that sufficient? Okay, so we'll return at 12:45. Um, Executive Director Wells, does that work for your team? I believe so. Um, okay. Um, See you all at 12.45, and we're looking forward to the community mitigation grants. To all of the team for your presentations this morning, thank you so much. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, we're reconvening, the uh, Massachusetts Gaming Commission is reconvening from its lunch break for our public meeting number 343. I'll just confirm that we're all here. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, good afternoon. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. And Commissioner Zuniga. Here. Uh, so we're all set to move forward and um, remarkably ahead of schedule, Joe. So um, you have our full and wide awake attention. Um, introduce uh, uh, Chief Delaney, our um, Chief of our Community Affairs Division. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm sure I will ruin the track record of us being ahead of schedule with this uh, presentation. Uh, so for your consideration today, we have 10 Community Mitigation Fund grant applications. Uh, four of them are specific impacts. We have one Community Planning Grant, three Transportation Planning Grants, and two Transportation Construction Grants. 
Um, and just before we get started, I'd like to once again um, thank the review team for all of its hard work in pulling together these recommendations. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank, you know, in no particular order, uh, Mary Thurlow, Enrique Zuniga, Joe Griffin, Kate Hardigan, Carrie Teresi, Tanya Perez, Teresa Fiore, and Crystal Howard. Um, this group has worked really well together this year. Um, they've been very flexible in, you know, their availability to meet on short notice and have met all of the deadlines that we've uh, needed to keep this process moving forward. So today, um, we'll first go over the remaining specific impact grants. And then, I, as I understand it, the commission would then like to vote all of the specific impact grants, of which we have said so we had seven from the previous meeting plus the four from today. Um, then after we do that, we'll proceed with the, the other uh, applications and review those. And I think um, the intent there is then to wait until the next meeting to vote all the remainder of the applications. So if we do in fact get through all of the 10 applications today, there will be eight remaining applications to be reviewed at the May 20th meeting. So unless there are any questions on process or anything of that nature, uh, we can jump right into the applications. There's only one process question before we get started with our business, and that is a congratulations to Mary Thurlow. She is a second time grandmother. Indeed. Now we can, now we can start, yes. Now we can wow, start. Wow, congratulations, that's wonderful. Yeah. Now we can start the official business. So thank you, uh, Jim. Okay, um, so the first application uh, in front of you is the Everett Police Department uh, Supplemental Personnel and Operational Funds. Um, so Everett uh, PD is seeking um, $215,000 for additional late night patrols and the purchase of vehicles for the Everett police officers assigned to the uh, gaming enforcement unit. Uh, the city has demonstrated a, a clear nexus to the casino as evidenced by an increase in late night calls. Um, however, the review team did not agree that the request for vehicles was commensurate with the impact associated uh, with the casino. Um, so back in 2020, uh, the city was awarded a grant uh, for late night patrols, which we were kind of expecting uh, would be used as a, as, as a test case, really, um, to see how that went. Now, of course, with the casino closures last year and then the reduced hours, uh, the city has only very recently started to use these funds, so we don't really have a whole lot of um, information on how that's going so far. Uh, but the review team agreed that providing these funds will help address an impact of the casino, and we do recommend funding that portion of the project. Um, the review team reviewed the request for the six vehicles uh, to be used by the Everett police uh, assigned to the, the GEU. Um, while the review team agreed that there is some need for members of this unit to be able to leave the casino to attend court, conduct surveillance and other activities, the request seemed uh, a little bit out of line with the frequency of the purposes stated for the vehicle use. Um, therefore, the review team is recommending the purchase of one vehicle rather than the six uh, requested. Um, and this uh, request was supported by Encore in their uh, response to, uh, to the uh, applications. So for these reasons, um, we are recommending partial funding of this grant in a total amount of $70,000. And with that, I'll open that up to any questions from the commission. Commissioner's questions for Joe. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, thank you. Um, but we did have the benefit of a, a two by two, so really got to discuss this, this matter and every other matter in depth um, and to really learn about the, the rationale of the team and in hearing, uh, how much work went in, how much they thought about prior, you know, precedent, what we've done with others. I, I, I thought that um, it was well-researched. Uh, the decision was really sound on this one. And, and I do agree that the, um, the vehicle um, 
the, the needs of the unit members to, to uh, attend outside training in court, uh, the one vehicle is, um, is commensurate with those needs. Commissioner O'Brien, did you have any comments or questions on this one? No, I didn't. I, I was briefed on it recently uh, by Joe and the team, and I agree with their conclusion. Yeah, and I want to encourage the commissioners. Um, the briefings are excellent, but if, if in any way you raised a question that might actually benefit the, the, the folks who weren't there, such as myself or whatever, um, I, we'd appreciate sharing those questions because it might spark an issue for us. That's the case with all of our briefings, right, guys? Um, so um, can I just ask, they wanted, how much does it, they were a fleet of six cars and what are they purchasing for cars? What would they ask? For, what, what is the kind of vehicle? I just wanted to know. Do they say? Um, hey, do you recall what type of vehicles they asked for? I don't, I'm not sure they specified particularly. They, okay. They didn't specify chair, however, um, because we know that, um, you know, that some of the uses here and that one of the uses may be in, ter um, in an investigative context, I would suspect that they will be um, you know, what's referred to in one of the other applications as soft cars or um, unmarked or undercover vehicles that would be harder to detect than unmarked police cruiser. So the balance is going to cover their car. I was just looking at the math. Um, okay. Yeah, so the, their original request for the six vehicles was $174,000 for the six vehicles. So a little That's under 30000 right. per vehicle, 29000 per vehicle. Thank you. And, and typically, Madam Chair, they go out to bid every year. Um, they put the specifications for what they'll need in a vehicle, and there are a couple of um, companies that will reply to the bid, and typically police agencies will go with the, uh, the lowest bid. Got it. And the only other thing I would point out is something that um, I think I pointed out last at our last meeting on uh, last Monday is where there where we are providing especially straightforward um, salary, or it's, it's overtime, but dollars to cover um, uh, the cost of, of overtime or salaries for the uh, law enforcement officers. I, it's not a requirement in our guidelines, but we are encouraging uh, training as well. And, and I would have loved to have seen in this, in this um, application, a request to, to complement um, the request. It, it could have been more money, but it would have complemented uh, that we are paying uh, for the overtime and if we could cover some training costs. I think that that only strengthens the application from my perspective. Otherwise, I'm all set on this one. Any, anything? Okay. So the next application that we have is uh, Foxborough Police Department um, uh, for some of their operational costs. Um, they are requesting $283,000 for three particular items. The first item are some pedestrian crosswalk lights on Route 140, which is sort of in downtown Foxboro. Um, they were looking for three undercover vehicles or soft vehicles as they're calling them. And then um, they have a request for some police training, including the overtime necessary to backfill those people when they're uh, off of training. So Foxboro has uh, presented uh, significant data to us showing increases in calls for service at the hotels in Foxboro and an increase in traffic accidents and traffic numbers on Route 1 uh, since the opening of the casino. So uh, the review team certainly agreed uh, that that establishes um, the appropriate nexus to the casino. Um, with respect to the pedestrian crosswalk lights, however, um, the town really was not able to provide us with any relevant information regarding the connection between uh, Route 140 uh, in downtown Foxborough and Plain Ridge Park. Um, you know, Route 140 runs kind of uh, northeast to south, uh, southeast to kind of northwest through the through the city through the town, and um, you know, it's not really a major route that goes to PPC. You know, Route One. 495 are sort of the two major routes with, of course with I-95 connecting into 495. Um, the town did submit us some traffic data, uh, but the traffic data that it submitted showed that traffic levels were fairly constant and, and none of that data 
predated the opening of the casino. So it was hard for us to say, you know, that there's been an increase in traffic or accidents or anything of that nature. So uh, with respect to the, to the pedestrian crosswalk lights, look, we love the idea of these things, but we have to have that nexus to the casino in order to recommend them. Um, and so, so we are not recommending that portion of this uh, application. With respect to the undercover vehicles, um, you know, the review team felt that this request was not really proportional uh, to the impact of the casino. Now, three vehicles may be perfectly appropriate, maybe a perfectly appropriate number, you know, for the Foxborough PD in its entirety. But we do have to keep in mind, again, that community mitigation funds are designed to offset the costs associated with the casino. Now, regardless of the presence of the casino, Foxborough would still be grappling with many of the issues that they identified in their application. Um, and while the review team agreed that Foxborough made a connection to the casino, that in and of itself doesn't mean that the community mitigation fund should then be sort of funding this, the entire program. Now, of course, it's not truly possible to pinpoint the exact cost of the impact. So the review team does have to use its judgment in trying to parse out the appropriate level of um, costs associated with the casino. So in this case, uh, again, with respect to the vehicles, the review team is recommending the purchase of one vehicle at a cost of uh, $34,000. And similar to the analysis on the vehicles, the review team uh, took the same approach with the training request. Um, while we're very supportive of police training, the request seemed to be out of line a little bit with the proportion of the costs, again, that could be associated with the casino. And similar to that vehicle request, the review team needed to use its judgment to try to figure out what percentage of the costs could be attributable to the casino. And with that said, we, we came down at recommending sending one member uh, to the accident reconstruction training three members uh, to the implicit bias training and three members uh, to the human trafficking training for a total cost, including uh, the back, the overtime backfill of uh, $47,000 for that piece of it. Um, Plainridge Park Casino uh, was given the opportunity to comment on uh, this application and they did not, they, 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 they wrote back to us but didn't have any particular comments on the application. So the review team recommends the award of uh, this grant to the town of Foxborough in the amount of $81,000 for the police training piece and for the purchase of one undercover vehicle. And with that, I will open this one up to any questions. Commissioner Cameron? Yes, I had a, um, I guess a clarification and um, in discussing this because I also agree that training is critical for police departments and these trainings all three of them are, are really pertinent trainings. Um, what is different about this request is that they are also requesting the backfill um, overtime. So you send that person to training and then another officer has to cover that shift. So it, it's not just a training cost they're asking us for, it is, it is a two-part you know, it's the officer in training and it's the officer to backfill, um, which is um, many police departments do not operate that way. They're able to train and still cover without an overtime. Um, maybe it's the size of Foxborough Union Contract, who knows, but, um, but I think that's what made this a particularly um, um, more expensive and it was important to use the nexus to the casino, and I think these numbers are more in line, um, knowing that we're also agreeing to um, uh, that backfill as well with, with the training. So I thought the team thought that out uh, rationally as well and, uh, and came up with a, an appropriate decision. Commissioner, thank you. And, and that was very helpful for me, um, Commissioner Cameron, to um, understand that that backfill practice isn't necessarily uniform across police departments. 
Um, Commissioner Zunica, do you have any questions? I know that you were involved, but do you want to have any commentary or provide commentary or? Yeah, I was um, I was wondering whether to make uh, the, this comment uh, now or or frankly at the beginning or at the end. Because the beginning had end and passed, but um, just as a reminder for for all of us, what we're seeing today are perhaps some of the grant requests where the review team agreed at some level, but then, you know, not entirely on all of the components or as Joe mentions, uh, the proportionality of the impact relative to the, you know, attributable to the casino relative to the request. Um, because we, this year, we're taking some of the um, grants in one meeting and, and, and some of the other ones at a later meeting, and we're doing this on a rolling basis. Effectively, what the, the grants, the grant requests that were easier to examine because they were straightforward already came before us in the early meetings. And because what, where we struggled a little bit with how to substantiate that proportionality, if you will, and that next is to the casino, we went back with questions and maybe had a second meeting, et cetera. So what we're about to see as evidence in the last two um, summaries that, uh, that Joe went are uh, these, these notions of partial funding perhaps because of those, those questions that he outlines, the, the, the nexus versus the proportionality. Um, in the case of Foxboro, they, uh, they are, um, you know, able to substantiate um, notions to the activity on Route 1 but when it came to root, uh, the route, um, is it 140 or 147? Uh, that goes in the other direction of the town, uh, right into the center of town, it's 147. Um, the, the nexus is a lot less clear and that's why the partial funding here is the recommendation. 140, 140. Yeah, route 140. 140, sorry. That's really helpful. I, I know that, um, Joe, you led with proportionality when you briefed me, um, and I understand that that's the, the challenge in the nexus has been a continuing challenge, right? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? No, I agree with everything that you said. Um, I was on the briefing with Commissioner Cameron, and um, you know she pointed out how the backfilling is not you know, necessarily par for the course, but then Kate pointed out smaller departments will sometimes have these arrangements of backfilling depending on when it is. So I, I think the recommendation is appropriate. So I, I did need clarification on the um, location of the, the traffic crossing. And so Joe has emphasized that it's not route one where the hotels are, where there are maybe some more casino pedestrians who are going in because we would want to make sure that they had safe cross, cross um, walks and that nexus would be clear. But um, it really is quite removed from that location, as I understand, and, and Joe provided a, a helpful map at the time. Uh, so I do think that probably <clears throat> that difficult link to the nexus with right now hasn't been achieved. Um, I'll tell you, I, I do think that it's really great that they ask for training dollars and that they, you know, particularly with respect to human trafficking, uh, you know, to the extent there's even a little bit of a, uh, evidence of that, although our public safety um, research has been quite clean, we want to make sure that the police departments have those tools. Um, I am a little disappointed to not be able to ensure um, implicit bias training for the entire department when they've asked, um, because it, it, it just seems that that would be something that any member of the department that shows up at the casinos, we would want them to have that training as a tool. I understand the other might be more specialized, but then I did understand the proportionality um, um, argument that Joe laid out. Um, I could offer to them that there's very good implicit uh, bias training available online um, that would not require um, anyone to be probably off on their duty. Um, 
I can't say how they run their departments, but certainly um, it's a tool that's very accessible and we've been the beneficiaries of that training. That doesn't necessarily mean that in-person training doesn't offer something different, but it is available. So I appreciate the request and I also appreciate the review team's analysis um, with a little bit of a lump in my throat, so. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's no question, you know, when we see these, these applications, we'd love to fund them all in full, you know, for the most part. Uh, you know, we, we, these are usually well thought out applications and they're good projects and they're things that we'd love to do, but, um, you know, that part of our charge and part of the law is that we have to make that nexus to the casino. So that kind of ties our hands a little bit. Commissioner Zuniga, you agree with that? On the training part, yeah. Okay, any other questions on this one? Thank you. Okay, the next one is the Springfield Blueprint Implementation. Um, this is a specific impact grant as well. It's not a public safety grant. Um, uh, so the city is requesting $400,000 for the implementation of the Springfield Blueprint. Um, the Springfield Blueprint was a document that was developed a few years ago uh, to try to guide development in the city. And, and one of the main areas that it identified, obviously, is the casino, what they're calling the casino impact zone. Um, so, you know, when MGM was built, um, it was expected that it would be a catalyst if for the redevelopment of properties in the vicinity of the casino. Um, now, the city did present us uh, some pretty significant information in its application um, that demonstrated that that really has not happened. Um, and in fact, there are numerous properties around the casino that are sort of lying fallow and deteriorating, um, some to the point of foreclosure. Um, you know, because of the prices paid by MGM to acquire the casino site, which were at kind of an inflated uh, basis, the landowners in the area have developed uh, unrealistic expectations about the value of their own properties and the rents that they could hope to get, um, which has kind of led to some of this, uh, some of these issues of vacancies and, uh, and deteriorating properties. Uh, so the review team certainly agreed that attempting to address uh, this type of impact is an appropriate use of the community mitigation funds. Uh, last year, we gave the city of Springfield a grant um, to develop a master plan for that casino impact zone, which they completed. Um, earlier this year and was just recently voted uh, by the Springfield City Council. Now this grant will advance that master plan by focusing on civic improvements in the casino impact zone, which includes the design of landscaping, hardscaping, streetscaping, lighting, uh, park improvements, infrastructure, and, and things of, of that nature. In parallel to that, the city will be utilizing its own funding uh, to continue some of the other efforts in the area, such as you know, they're looking to acquire some of those foreclosed properties that they can then put out to um, developers to redevelop. Um, they already own some properties there. There's the church that's located there on Court Square that they want to put that out to bid for redevelopment. Um, so they're going to continue to work on those while these funds would, would work towards that so those civic improvements. Um, and the review team certainly believes that this approach will help address uh, the impacts to the area and establish improvements that will make the area more attractive to developers uh, down the road. Uh, MGM was also uh, fully supportive of awarding this grant. And um, so therefore the review team recommends awarding a grant in the amount of $400,000 um, to the city for this uh, blueprint implementation. I'll open this one up for questions. Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to? Do you have any questions on this? Are you all set? No, I'm all set. I, I remember during the briefing. I remember the furniture store guy in the back who held out for a long time, um, and I wasn't shocked to hear that some of the abutters and, and people in the area were doing the same thing. So, I, I think it's appropriate. I think it's good money spent for them to come up with a plan and improve what they can. Excellent. Commissioner Zunica. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, 
perhaps a little of, of my own experience with reading and, and discussing this grant request um, is appropriate. I, um, when I first read it, um, my impression was that you know there was just a lot of words, really, a lot of planning um, terminology and 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 etc. And, and and I had this feeling of um, and I, I think it was also shared by the review team. This this feeling of you know where, where is the the deliverable? Uh, where are we going to see some concrete uh, steps? And through the back and forth with the city, that became more clear, which Joe articulated. And it boils down to the notion that there's the need, uh, which we all agree with, to try to tackle uh, some of the difficulties uh, that the city is is undergoing with with the waters and the like in multiple ways. So even, even though it may seem that um, there's just a lot of planning, because now this is the second grant, um, there's, there's in, my, in my opinion, there's, there's both the realization that it's needed and the, the shorter term horizon that there's more concrete steps. I'm, I'm curious as to what the next year's requests are gonna be relative to these efforts but I think altogether they're very worthwhile efforts on, on, on part of the city to really try to lean on landowners, abutters, et cetera, to improve the area. No, I agree, appropriate um, use of money to be used in this way. And I'm all set, I think it's, uh, very clear, and its impact very clear. Thank you. Joe, do you want to continue? Yes. Um, so the final uh, specific impact grant is the West Springfield Police and Fire slash EMS uh, request. So they are uh, asking for $200,000 to offset the costs of public safety personnel that were hired in anticipation of the MGM casino opening. So just uh, a little bit of background on this. Um, back in 2020, uh, we awarded West Springfield a grant of the amount of $200,000 um, for public safety costs with the understanding that it was a one-time grant and that any future requests would need to be based on the approved look back study uh, that was being conducted at that time. So I think um, I've described it a little bit last year as um, it was a little bit of a leap of faith uh, on, on what, the, what they had done for hiring and, and the cost, and we agreed that it was appropriate, but we said if there were any other requests, we, we, need, we need hard data to, to, to back that up. So the look back study uh, was completed uh, in November of 2020, and it did conclude that public safety costs associated with MGM impacts exceeds the uh, $375,000 in payments that West Springfield receives as part of its surrounding community agreement. Now, the study did also indicate that West Springfield overshot the mark uh, in their hiring of 16 additional personnel, but concluded uh, that MGM's impacts are responsible for just under 50% of the costs of those personnel. I think the actual number is 49. 7% is what is attributable to MGM. So in essence, what they're really saying is West Springfield probably should have hired eight personnel rather than the 16 that they did. So without getting into too much math here, um, the look back study identified about $585,000 in public safety costs that they would attribute to MGM's impacts uh, for fiscal year 2022. Now, the town disagreed with that and characterized those costs as more like $652,000, taking into account some inflation and salaries and things of that nature. Now, if you subtract out the $375,000 they receive under the surrounding community agreement, that leaves a delta of either $210,000 or $277,000, depending upon which set of numbers you believe, which is, to us, is essentially irrelevant since the the ask is 200,000, you know, it works for either set of numbers. So we're not really particularly concerned with which, which number is, you know, the absolute right number. 
So, you know, given this evidence, um, the review team agrees that West Springfield has demonstrated a casino related impact, um, has put a dollar value to it, um, and recommends that West Springfield be awarded a grant in the amount of $200,000. Now, um, you know, I think we need to note here that MGM did not support this application. Um, they believed uh, that a flawed rationale was used in the development of the costs, and they also believe that MGM's operation is not resulting uh, in net negative impacts to West Springfield. But, you know, that statement is a statement. Um, so absent any data to the contrary, uh, the review team felt that the decision needed to be based on the data that we had in front of us, which was the look back study that showed a net negative impact. So that's how we kind of got to the recommendation of uh, the $200,000 for West Springfield. And I'll open this one up for questions. Mr. Cameron. Um, yes, I thought an important piece of information was this uh, look back study was required and MGM picked the firm and they paid for it. Um, so to me that was a relevant piece of information and um, you know, I think in this case, we don't have to um, necessarily uh, put our weight in what MGM says or West Springfield because we have a reputable study that demonstrates the impacts. So I think the, the team um, was, um, was smart to, to, to look at this $200,000 number, which was the request and say, look, it doesn't take into account either, uh, either side, West Springfield or MGM, but it is, uh, those are the numbers based on the, um, based on the look back, which you told them, that's what we'd be relying on for any further monies. So I'm, I'm in agreement with this one as well. Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Zuniga, do you want to weigh in? Commissioner O'Brien. No, I would agree with what Commissioner Cameron said. I, I remember that we delayed voting on this last year because we wanted the information um, and you have an objective party coming in with information that, that backs up the request right now. So I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Zuniga, you're nodding your head. Do you want to add? All set. I'm all set as well. And thank you, Commissioner Cameron, for the recap on, on the independence of the, um, the third party. Review. Okay, so that that concludes the specific impact grant applications. So at this point, if you wanted to do the votes on those, we could do that. Or if you want me to just continue with my presentations till we're done, and then we can go back. Whatever, whatever your preference is. Commissioners, I, we agreed at the last meeting that um, at our agenda today meeting that we would like to vote on sort of categories, and this concludes what I refer to as the public safety um, uh, specific intent, right? Is what we call it. Um, do we, um, should, you know, I, I, I don't believe I saw this in the motions uh, that are always prepared just for us as kind of a tool, right? Do you want to um, vote singularly on each of them or, um, because they, they do have different recommendations. Would that be best? I see Commissioner Cameron maybe nodding her head, or should we go um, on mass? Individually? Um, Commissioner I was just gonna say last year, we, we did vote everything kind of on mass, um, uh, but I'd leave that up to Todd on, on what his recommendation would be to, to do it. Um, I know on the, on the workforce ones, we did vote them individually. Well, I only invite that because that would give the, um, the uh, Commissioners the opportunity to vote against a recommendation individually if they would like. Um, uh, I'm not hearing in our discussion anything that would flag that we don't have a consensus with the review team, but I don't want to presume that ever. So commissioners. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine either way, uh, I just as a matter of process, um, if we were to vote them, the prior ones individually, uh, I think we need to go back into the prior memo to look back at, which I don't have in front of me, to, to have the amounts and whatnot uh, specifically. But I can do that in short order. 
Yeah, uh, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I, I don't have a preference either. I do take your point though, that it does give us an opportunity to speak on each one and maybe uh, there would be a dissent. Although I agree that we didn't seem to, um, uh, we didn't hear any during our discussion. Commissioner, I'm looking for you to go back because I don't have it. I don't have each memo. In front so of I, I have the, 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 April 26th memo in front of me here. I could either share that and we can walk through it or I can just read off what the particular numbers are that we're recommending. I'm, I'm comfortable with a process where we have a motion and that we um, uh, start with a motion to adopt the following and then on a line by line um, we'll take a vote uh, if we have that if we have the, the um, individual items just so that it's we're presenting because next year it could be based on a dollar issue, right? Commissioner Zuniga, which is what you're alluding to. So Commissioner O'Brien, are you comfortable with that uh, on process? Uh, that yeah, that's fine. I, I have the same issue everyone else does. I don't have a breakdown, right. but if Joe, yeah. Joe could share his screen and we don't yeah. have to go back. And I think, is it okay if we do one motion with each and then we'll just in, individually vote and then we'll finalize to say that? I, I don't, it doesn't sound like any of us are, are really taking issue with specific no. Okay, excellent. Okay. So we'll run through. Do I have a, a, a motion? We'll just take an overriding motion and then run through individually on a vote. And what is the first the category, impact? Joe? These are um, the specific, specific impacts. Specific impacts. That's the language we should use on this. Yeah. Okay. Specific impacts. We, so we're waiting for the individual numbers. Okay. So I think you're going to scroll through. Through. Mm -hmm. All right. So is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. So on Everett Fire Department. Uh, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $157,000. So, Ma Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission approve the award of the specific impact grant from the Community Mitigation Fund for the City of Everett in the amount of $157,000 for the purposes uh, described in the commissioner's packet from the last meeting and discussed here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the commission staff be authorized to execute the grant instrument commemorating the award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. Mr. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? I guess I have to do roll call, don't I? Um, I just not seeing Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. He's really frozen now. It was a it was a slow. Aye. Cater. There we go. And uh, oh yes. Perhaps we can do. Um, I'm wondering if Joe can do all of the numbers and then we can do an omnibus motion that just references how he laid them out for this specific impact and then just do one more motion at the end. Okay. Let's just speed it up a little bit. I know Enrique's yes. internet's a little laggy, so. Okay, so all right, I'll lay, I'll lay out all of them. So the next one, um, City of Everett again, for the street light smart controls, we're recommending a grant in the amount of thirty thousand dollars for that one. Um, the Hamden County District Attorney's Office. We are recommending a grant in the amount of seventy-five thousand dollars for that one. Um, the Hamden County Sheriff's Department, uh, we are recommending a grant in the amount of $400,000. Uh, the Plainville Police Department, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $95,500.
Uh, Springfield Fire Department, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $22,000. Springfield Police Department, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $22,500. Okay, and that's the final one from last meeting. So, um, and then let me just share the, this, this meetings, we'll just walk through those last. Given my internet connection, I think someone else should make the motions. Mm -hmm. Second. I'll try this one more time, sorry about that. Okay, so the next one we're recommending, Everett uh, Police Department, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $70,000. For Foxborough, Foxborough, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $81,000. That was Foxborough PD, correct? Foxborough PD, yes, yeah. Uh, Springfield Blueprint Implementation, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $400,000. And on West Springfield Police and Fire, uh, we're recommending a grant in the amount of $200,000. Is that all? That sure. is all of the specific impacts, yeah. Sure. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the awards of the specific impact grants discussed on April 26th and today, and also included in the respective packets for those dates. Um, those grants will be coming from the Community Mitigation Fund in the amounts set forth in the packets and is summarized by Joe, Joe Delaney at this meeting. For the purposes that are described in the commissioner's packets and the submitted applications, uh, the commission and that commission staff be authorized to execute grant instruments commemorating the awards in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. My only discussion would be I I, um, I want to reserve always the right for us to vote on these line by line. And if there's anyone here who has any uh, comment or concern about something specific you can you can vote that but i'm not i'm detecting a consensus so we'll move forward with a roll call vote um and then we'll figure out process going forward on this okay excellent commissioner cameron aye commissioner o'brien aye commissioner zuniga aye and i vote yes thank you four zero vivian um and we'll just make sure to record that uh, properly in our minutes. Thanks. Okay. Joe, what's next? Okay, so we are into the transportation planning category. We've got um, three uh, transportation planning uh, grants. The first one is uh, in Chicopee, in Chicopee Center. They want to do some work looking at their streetscapes in, in, in the center. So they're requesting $200,000 to design uh, streetscape improvements in downtown Chicopee. It would also include complete streets concepts to improve the flow and safety of all modes of travel, including pedestrians, bicycles, vehicles, and public transit. So the original environmental impact report for the MGM project projected that about four and a half percent of the traffic from the casino would travel through Chicopee on local streets with most of that uh, going through Chicopee Center. Um, there are also many MGM employees that reside in Chicopee uh, that commute to the facility and surveys done by the city indicate that many of uh, Chicopee's residents are patrons of MGM as well. 
Um, so the review team agreed that these demonstrated an impact on uh, the city of uh, Chicken. So now the city will use these funds to hire a consultant to evaluate downtown Chicopee and pr propose conceptual designs and recommendations. It will also include a uh, robust public participation process. Um, the review team agreed uh, you know, that these types of projects that improve the flow and safety of multiple modes of travel will address uh, negative impacts while also encouraging alternative modes of transportation to and from MGM which helps support the notion of transportation demand management, which uh, you know, was, was a requirement of MGM's uh, permits. Uh, so all of these transportation planning and construction uh, applications were forwarded not only to our licensees, but also to MassDOT for their opinion on um, the efficacy of the applications. So in this case, both MGM and MassDOT were fully supportive of uh, this application. And therefore, uh, we recommend uh, that Chicopee be awarded a grant in the amount of $200,000 for its streetscape improvement project. And with that, I will open this one up to questions. Questions on this? Commissioner Zunica, did you have any comment? No, I think as, as Joe mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great project. Uh, I think it will go a long way to improving the, um, the general feel of the um, Chicopi downtown. And there's enough traffic there through employees and patrons that can be attributable to the casino um, that it merits this funding. I, I agree, appropriate use of mitigation monies. I'll start. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next one is the Everett uh, Mystic River Walk. Um, Everett is requesting uh, $200,000 to advance uh, design of a section of the Mystic River Walk uh, to complete a missing section of the walkway between Mystic View Park and Route 16. So let me just um, quickly see if I can share um, this is my favorite part of community mitigation not fund application review when Joe brings us to the yeah <laughs> uh, let me just open up uh, Google Maps real quick that's really helpful um, and I will zoom in so you can see where Encore Boston Harbor is. And we have the Gateway Center here, which is where the Target and Costco and all of those are. So Encore's um, walkway is connected over through here. And there's a series of paths and walkways through this area. What we have is a little gap right up here from these walkways up to some existing connections underneath the, the bridge that goes over the Malden River. So it's essentially this sort of a line right through here is what they want to do. It's a little bit of a challenging site because there's some, uh, there's some wetlands and there's, um, you know, you can see there's a little brook here and some wetlands. But you can see these little pathways here, these are, are underpasses underneath Route 16 that allow people on bikes to get you know, up and down from the bridge and use the bike lanes and so on. So this would make this connection through here, um, which is right now, if you want to go out there, you have to go out onto Route 16 and through Santilli Circle and it's, you know, kind of worth your life. And what you'll see over here is we've got Wellington T Station is right here. And just zooming out, you have this whole area up here of, of many uh, large apartment and condo complexes. You have, uh, um, name of it is escaping me, Station Landing over here, which has multiple, multiple uh, uh, apartment uses and things and condos again. And then you go further down and there's, there's some very large developments in this area and obviously some huge uh, residential 
neighborhoods. Again, this is what I'm probably uh, belaboring the point, but you know, we love um, projects like this that will you know, close in these gaps and these walkways and create this really great network where people can safely use these bike paths and walkways and make their way to the casino or otherwise. So um, we really we really like um, a project like this. Again, Encore and MassDOT were fully supportive of the project. And um, so therefore we recommend uh, the $200 for that project. Any questions for Joe or Riverwalk? Yeah, Joe. Commissioner Kim. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I love the Google Maps, and they'll build a little a little boardwalk over those wetlands, like they do on the golf courses or the bike trails on the Cape, and um, it'll be it'll be excellent for those folks to be able to take their bikes or walk uh, over there. So I I think this is a really good use of the mitigation rooms. Any any other comments or questions for Joe? Yeah, Joe. Commissioner Zumaga, are you? Sure, I, I agree with these kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, you're not frozen. Sorry, I thought you were. You're good. We can hear okay. you. Continue. Okay. Yeah. So um, I like like everyone else. I I like these kinds of projects. It's all about improving the network of uh, bike and um, I have this image in my mind. Um, about uh, the bike rack in at, at Angkor Boston Harbor by the employee entrance. Um, when uh, near near the inauguration, um, there was just dozens and dozens of bikes of people who had employees who had gone out there, um, you know, using a bike. It was of course a very nice uh, weather time, uh, although that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not used in the winter. Um, so I think it's uh, these kinds of projects that are, are a great alternative to the traffic all around it. And I'm, I'm glad that they're we're helping the effort that's ongoing. And and similarly, MassDOT supports this application as well. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. There was recently in the Boston Globe on um, their magazine on places to live. And in, in its category for housing prices, Everett ranked number one for the North. Um, and they mentioned, I don't know if you saw the article, but they mentioned um, how many employees of Encore Boston Harbor want to live in Everett. And I suspect the more we make um, biking accessible, um, it will only make it more attractive and for Medford and the surrounding areas. So. Uh, that that that's a was a very positive article for um, the impact of of um, the casino. So on that community, no further comments or questions on that one. All right, moving ahead. Okay, moving moving right along. Uh, the next one is uh, Lynn is requesting um, some money to design some traffic and safety improvements at Boston Street and Hamilton Street. So they're requesting $200,000 for this project. Um, the intent of the project is to decrease the number and severity of crashes at that location, uh, improve traffic operations, and also improve access uh, to the Northern Strand Community Trail. Um, so this, this uh, you know, right off the bat, we are, we are not recommending uh, funding for this project. Um, and I, I wanna give some, some good background on why why we got to that point with this. Um, firstly, you know, the impact of casino related traffic on the city of Lynn um, is minor. Uh, according to the original environmental impact report document, it was estimated that about 10% of the tra traffic to and from the casino would be from areas sort of north and east of the facility. Um, about 9% of that traffic was expected to use Route 1 with about 1% using the local roads to the Northeast, such as Route 1A and Route 107. Uh, with an average daily trip generation of about 24,000 vehicles a day um, at Encore Boston Harbor, um, about 2,400 of those would expect, be expected to go to those points north and east of the site. With the vast majority of these going up Route 1, you know, so about 2,160 vehicles per day up Route 1. 
Now, Route 1 doesn't pass through Lynn proper. Um, it sort of goes up along one side of it. And we certainly would expect that some casino-related traffic using Route 1 could be coming from or passing through Lynn. But, you know, trying to look at sort of a worst case estimate, we believe that a maximum amount of vehicles that would pass through Lynn uh, or come from Lynn uh, to or from the casino might be as much as maybe 450 vehicles per day. So that would be 225 going to the facility, 225 coming back. Um, and it's also expected that this traffic would generally use the major routes in and out of uh, town, such as um, routes 107 and, uh, and 1A. And I, again, I'm gonna share my, my Google Maps again, um, just so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. So the intersection in question is right up here where it's like you see West Lynn. There, there are these uh, two streets that come together here. This is Hamilton, this is Boston Street. And um, I'll zoom in just a little bit. Um, now you can see the Encore Casino is down here. And as the crow flies, that's uh, about eight or nine miles from the facility. And you can see here, you know, traffic coming out of Encore to that sort of northeast area would tend to use Route 16 and they would either get on Route 1 north or continue over to Route 1A. And you can see here 1A goes up along the coast, 107 comes up this way. Um, you know, to be using this intersection to access Encore just seems quite unlikely. Um, and again, just sort of uh, just zooming in on this a little bit. Um, you know, this is the intersection here. Um, and this, of course, the Northern Strand Trail does run right here, which ultimately comes down through uh, Everett and, and eventually will we'll be coming to the site. But again, we're talking about a, about a nine mile bike ride from this location. And we can't really put our fingers on what improvements to how improvements to this intersection would either encourage more traffic to use the, the Northern Strand. It just, you know, the connections just didn't seem to be there for us. Um, so yeah, you know, with respect to this particular application, oh, you know, in previous grant rounds, um, the commission did accept that there would be some minor impacts to the city streets due to, due to traffic. And we did award the city a couple of grants to uh, study certain improvements that could be done. But at that time, you know, we viewed those as, as kind of seed money to start the process on some very large projects. For example, we gave them money last year for the Route 107 project. Now, the Route 107 project is a, I think a $30 million project that, you know, while it will have some ancillary benefits to casino uh, traffic, the major benefit is truly to the, to the city. And so we felt, again, that providing some seed money to get those projects started was appropriate, but that was really about all that we could um, uh, sort of justify. Now with respect to this particular application, um, we couldn't see how there would be an appreciable amount of traffic uh, using these particular streets. Um, it is a heavily traveled intersection. There's about 20,000 vehicles per day that use that intersection. Um, but we didn't, we just didn't believe that the casino traffic would make up anything more than a really de minimis portion of the traffic on that road. And we also, we were intrigued by the connection to the Northern Strand, but we also didn't see how improvements to the, the intersection would material, materially affect the use of the Northern Strand. Um, so with respect to uh, Encore, they did support this project. Um, they usually do um, support projects for communities nearby. Uh, but MassDOT did have some reservations about this project, uh, particularly with the proposed project cost and also the fact that the project had not been initiated uh, in the MPO process. So essentially, for these reasons, we are not recommending funding uh, for this project. And with that, I'll open this one up for questions. Well, looks like I'm seeing satisfied. I, I I'll just add probably probably what every everyone's thinking is that I I I feel that the review team really thoroughly 
considered uh, this application. And I appreciate, you know, you're really thinking about the potential for the, the bike trail to come through. Um, I, it's always hard to turn down an application, but I, I felt very comfortable with your, your thought process and your recommendation and respect both Encores and MassDOT's um, input. So, you know, and again, we would love to fund all of these projects. You know, I, there, there are a few projects that we've seen that didn't have some merit to them, but, um, you know, again, we're, we are sort of bound by that uh, edict that we have to find that nexus to the casino. And, and next year too, Joe, I'm sure when you uh, put out the guidelines and the applications, you'll be doing your, you know, outreach and always communities that think they, they may have a, a valid application have the opportunity to, to speak with the group and, and you'll probably do that same kind of training that you did this year. So, um, you know, I guess I would say perhaps there's another application in the future for Lynn, but this one, you know, I feel that your, your recommendation is, is, is very well supported. Okay. Um. So the next one is um, uh, another project in Everett on the Northern Strand, uh, some trail lighting improvements. Um, so Everett's requesting $135,000 for the installation of lighting on the Northern Strand Community Trail uh, from its current terminus at Wellington Ave uh, north up to the River Green District. Um, so just a little bit of background on this. Last year, we uh, gave Everett a grant to extend the Northern Strand from its current terminus down uh, to the project site, to the uh, Encore site. Um, and that portion of the project will include lighting. Um, so Encore built a, an overflow parking lot up in the River Green area for both employees and for overflow parking from the casino, which is serviced by a shuttle bus. Uh, but the thought there was that if some lighting could be provided on the Northern Strand Trail up to that location. It would make it more of a, a 24 hour transportation corridor rather than just being used uh, during, during the daylight hours. Um, and of course, we always agree that any, anything that will improve the, the bicycle pedestrian network has a good potential to take some vehicles off the road, which will ultimately help the traffic overall in the area and the traffic to the casino as well. Now, this project was actually constructed last year. Um, the project ran into some change orders and cost overruns for which the city had not budgeted. Um, so the total cost of the project came to about $452,000 with the $135,000 in change orders. So um, the city is requesting our funds just for those uh, change orders that they, they ran into. And this amounts to about 30% of the total construction cost, uh, which falls well within our guidelines of not funding more than one third of the project costs. So, that, so you know, the review team felt that this project, you know, in conjunction with the Northern Strand extension uh, down to the Encore site will improve access to the River Green area and reduce uh, use of single occupancy vehicles. Um, the project is completely consistent with the other bike and pedestrian projects that have been funded in the area, um, which will ultimately complete an extensive network of bike and pedestrian options for getting to and from the casino. And again, both Encore and MassDOT were uh, fully supportive of this project. Um, therefore, we're recommending uh, fully funding this uh, project at $135,000. So I'll open this one up for comments. Yeah, I agree with the team. This is an appropriate use for the uh, mitigation monies. And I think everyone's nodding their heads. Uh, great endorsement by uh, Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, just to uh, I think the statement was that it would be, um, has the opportunity to make substantial and lasting improvements to our area. This project is one that could lead to significant regional improvement in the future. So, ringing endorsement. Okay. Okay, so the next one is uh, uh, City of Springfield. Um, this is for some uh, roadway resurfacing and complete streets improvements. Again, a transportation construction project. 
Um, so Springfield's requesting $200,000 for resurfacing and complete streets improvements on Dwight Street and Hamden Street in Springfield, in downtown Springfield. So Dwight Street is a major, uh, primarily southbound route from I-291 in downtown Spring to downtown Springfield. Um, you know, a substantial amount of traffic from I-90 westbound uses uh, 291 and Dwight Street to access the casino. You know, if you if you continue on 291, you have to do a merge onto 91 and then cross three lanes of traffic to make the exit. And I think people who are in the know uh, will often take that Dwight Street. I know I've used it numerous times myself, and I think most of the commissioners have as well in going out to Springfield. Um, so we certainly agreed that the amount of traffic that uses Dwight Street uh, constitutes an impact uh, of the casino. So the project will not only improve the pavement structure on the street, but it will also incorporate complete streets elements, um, you know, improving access for all modes of transportation, uh, not only vehicles, but uh, pedestrians, uh, bicycles, public transit. Um, and one nice thing about this project is, you know, MGM did a whole bunch of these complete streets improvements to Main Street, State Street, Columbus Ave. Um, you know, Dwight Street being another major route, this will bring that sort of up to that same standard that MGM was, was required to do on those streets, um, which again will just improve uh, overall transportation. Um, the $200,000 request is uh, exactly one third of the total project cost of $600,000, um, which is in line with our guidelines. And also both MGM and MassDOT are, are fully supportive of this project. And so we are recommending awarding uh, the $200,000 for this project. Any questions? Commissioner Zuniga. Just as you said, um, and I saw some heads nodding, this is, um, you know, the traffic uh, counts don't quite tell the story uh, because if you try to go by what Google tells you and, and go to the casino coming from from Route 90 into uh, 91, um, that is really difficult. And so most people will come and do use Dwight Street, um, which perhaps again the figures undercount um, how we count important that connection is uh, as, as you go into the casino. Okay, if there are no other comments on that, um, we'll move on to our, our last one of the day, um, which is a, this is a community planning grant, um, and this is the Northampton, uh, the Northampton Live website uh, marketing program. So uh, Northampton is requesting uh, $75,000 to continue um, the marketing program uh, of the Northampton Live website. Um, just again, a little bit of uh, a deeper background on this. Um, back in 2020, um, you know, we've awarded grants uh, for this platform a couple of different times, most recently last year. Um, we did a, award a grant to Northampton uh, with the understanding that Northampton needed to move this platform towards a self-sustaining model. Uh, you know, and while the review team didn't envision funding this project beyond 2020, many of the initiatives that had been planned to make it financially independent were unable to be met uh, doing, due to the ongoing pandemic. You know, you know, there were restaurants and stores and other things that were all closing up shop and trying to ask merchants for, for money under that uh, um, atmosphere would be uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible. So we, we agreed that, um, you know, just the, sort of the timing of this was, was, was really, really difficult. Um, so now the original and continuing purpose of this Northampton Live website is to mitigate impacts on Northampton from the development of MGM Springfield, really by helping Northampton compete against, you know, the significant marketing resources of MGM. You know, they, it gives them certainly not a voice as, as loud as, as uh, what MGM has with their, you know, advertising campaigns and others, 
but it does give them a, a sort of a fighting chance to uh, to eat, you know keep their existing uh, customers and hopefully grow their customer base somewhat. Um, so now Northampton has actually made some strides towards becoming self-sustaining. Um, they did agree to provide uh, $25,000 of matching funds towards this grant. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's a move in the right direction. Um, and MGM is also supportive of this request. Um, they, they sort of contend that, that they're really complementary to a place like Northampton and not really in direct competition. But I think we can see that, you know, uh, any competition for sort of entertainment dollars is, is competition. So, uh, but they are definitely supportive of that. Now, uh, because of the difficulties over the last year in obtaining other sources of funding, the review team recommends awarding this grant in the amount of $75,000. And again, we do expect that Northampton needs to make those efforts to become self-sustaining. Uh, you know, if, if um, a platform like this needs continual subsidies from the Gaming Commission, you know, perhaps the platform isn't as successful as it, as it should be. Um, so with that, we are recommending the 75,000, but we do uh, expect North, uh, Northampton to continue making those efforts to uh, create a financing model that doesn't rely on commission funds, you know, forever. And with that, I'll open this one up for any, any questions or comments. Commissioners. You know, I'll um, I'll mention that um, in the past I I was I would go along with this type of request mostly as Joe said because it had the caveat of it's going to be uh, helping the one-time costs and then the city could take over um, you know for the longer term um, but this year uh, is really one that has been uh, has brought a lot of um, impact, I, I guess, to to the restaurant industry. Um, and if we can be of uh, some assistance uh, to the city of Northampton, um, I think it's a good um, a good way to do it. Other comments? I, I would agree as well. Um, under the circumstances and uh, with the uh, with the notion that they will at some point become self-sufficient with this I, I agree with the team's recommendation commissioner brian any thoughts no joe made the same comments in the briefing uh, which i thought were pretty compelling in terms of you know giving them this for this year with the idea that they would you know, when things turn around, hopefully over the next coming months, that they can look for funding that makes them self-sustaining. Yeah, this is where I probably have to continue to think this through. Um, I was, um, I'm, I guess I wonder if I'm as, as if the argument about self-sustaining is as compelling, because I do feel as though Northampton, which has had always a big tourist draw for its restaurants, um, you know, wakes up after, you know, the casino is built. And when you are trying to line up the marketing dollars against the marketing dollars, it's a significant impact on their own budgetary process. Uh, suddenly, they want to make sure that they're not losing any of their um, their restaurant diners and, and their visitors to the casino or more appropriately be able to leverage from the you know the, the benefit of the casino so i am i i like the idea of supporting the marketing programs of the um, neighboring towns um and nights i maybe i see the, the nexus more clearly so um that will be something we can talk about perhaps in the guidelines going forward maybe i need further clarification and and, and to understand um, every commissioner's position on this. Um, but I, I, I do, I like this last year and I, I like, I'm, I'm very pleased that the recommendation is to support it this year. And with especially the backdrop of the impact of COVID-19 on the restaurant. Um, 
industry. Hi, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair. This is Joe. I just uh, my my whole uh, system just crashed on me, so I had to oh. had to call in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so maybe you didn't hear that I my comments. So we can discuss them later, Joe. <laughs> I don't need to repeat. Them. My my I've been, my just I've been just frantically some, trying. No, my I think the just the, the comments were everybody supports your recommendation, and everybody. Um, seems to really support it, particularly because the, the notion of, of Northampton becoming self-sustaining in the future on their marketing. And I guess I, I just expressed a viewpoint that's slightly different, but, uh, but I'm open to being convinced otherwise. I just, um, for this, I'm very pleased that this recommendation stands um, as is uh, to support Northampton. Yes. Oh, and there I'm he back. is again. I'm back. What a funny day, huh? We've all had our, our tech issues. Eileen, and uh, you've done very well today. Gail, occasionally it's been a little bit to slow down too. Must be, must be May 6th, huh? 2021. So. I haven't uh, had that happen before though, where, I, I mean, the, I did, it completely shut off I, and it was gone. It was gone, completely. Wow. You know, I've frozen up before, but never had it completely cut off like that. But. Yeah. And then you called in and then it, it came back. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, um, mysteries. So I think, um, I, I think there are no further questions on this one, but we are not taking a vote today because we know that there'll be other proposals in the various categories and we'll do our voting uh, per category. Sure. Yep, we, we'll have, like I said, we have eight more to get through uh, at the next meeting, uh, hopefully. Um, we have one more follow-up uh, call. Uh, uh -oh. Oh. No. So close, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so close. He froze in a way that's not his best I, thing. I think we got the gist of what he was saying, though. You know, he's finishing up those last eight, and we'll be ready to go. And yeah. there he is. This, I'm back. Back. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Okay, so um, I think then that, that concludes uh, Chief Delaney's report for today, right? And um, I and I want to just uh, praise the entire review team, and of course, give a big shout out to to uh, Mary and, and Tanya for their continuing support of Joe, uh, Joe's good work. So thank you. Uh, commissioners, you're all set. Uh, and just in case you freeze again, Joe, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I'll go give my Wi-Fi a rest. <laughs> I think everybody is, should put their uh, devices to sleep shortly after this meeting. Um, so um, in terms of our agenda, that brings us to item number 11. Are there any commissioner updates? No, no, okay, then we'll move on. There's no other business. Then um, the only thing I should note for other businesses today apparently is National Nurse Day. And um, I think all of us can um, someday, some moment today um, recognizes the nurses in our lives and also the um, just the, the global effort that nurses have made this last year. So um, just an acknowledgement. And a big thank you to the entire team, to Executive Director Wells and to Vivian, who is probably thinking this has been a good long meeting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vivian. So with that, Commissioners, do you have anything you'd like to add? Would you like to move? Motion to adjourn. Second. Excellent. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate all your good work and, and your support. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. And thank you, Kathy. Aye. Thank you. Okay, and I vote yes, Vivian. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.